The following content has been provided by RWTH, Aachen University. All right, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Um, Designing Interactive Systems 2, today we're going to be talking about the, uh, the X window system and uh, Smalltalk, two um, pretty original window systems, and especially X, which I gave you a little sneak peek of uh, last time, um, is a really interesting system because of its openness and its, its layer architecture that is very clear and, and, and well structured. So a lot of people have been tinkering with it, using it to try out new ideas of how window systems could work or how a particular part of it could be exchanged. For example, if you have an idea of a different way for people to manage their windows on screen, you could exchange the window manager in X and everything else would just be there for you to use. And that's pretty much the only system that is in, you know, sort of that has a wide user base and that is available for a lot of platforms where you can do that. So let's look at X. Um, we had a brief look at the architecture that I told you about, um, which was basically that the window system is now split up with a, a network um, cut in the middle. You still have you know, the hardware and the, the operating system running down here, the user sitting in front of it, typing, looking at the screen. Um, but parts of the uh, window system are now situated on this end of the network, if you like, in, on the computer in front of the user, whereas other parts are actually running um, somewhere else. And uh, remember the uh, confusion about server and client. The server is the thing that would typically be running on a terminal in front of you. And the client app that is doing something, doing some computation and uh, doing some business logic is something that is running on a big mainframe somewhere, which we would naturally usually call the server. But that's why the names are reversed. Right? So if you, if you like, the uh, server is running on a client and the client is running on a server. And the window manager being off here to the side. So um, what the, uh, the X server does, if we, if we zoom in a little more closely here, is that it basically provides the things that the base window system does and provides the things that a graphics library does. Uh, so it talks to the hardware, um, to the operating system, renders drawing commands, receives events in the graphics event library, and um, is then also sort of responsible for managing these base window system level windows, right? Rectangular errors on the screen. Um, the, <coughs> the X server itself is a program that you just launch on a computer. So it's not even running as part of the operating system by default, but you actually run it as a, as a user level process. And then it sits here and, uh, and receives commands from the network and processes them and uh, does the input-output on the local computer that's in front of the user. The X server itself is split up into two layers, um, which again create a kind of sub-virtual machine level here with a um, device-dependent X and device-independent X level so that the device-dependent one knew exactly, for example, what kind of resolution the screen had, how many colors it could render, whether it was black and white or, or, or a color. Uh, whereas the uh, device independent X layer uh, didn't have to worry about many of those things. The um, an X was actually um, standardized by the ISO, so it's, uh, the the API to write applications that run on X are um, are standardized by the ISO, um, but it still has um, sort of a limit because X is open source and, and you can change any part about it if you want to and people have. Um, but if you change it, if you change the X server, if you change the API, that basically means that you are um, sort of trying to change the protocol. And the protocol between the client and the server that goes across the network is static. It's not built to be extended dynamically with new kinds of um, events or something like this. So. Um, if you mess with it, you're basically building a new X server, you're changing the way to talk to it, and you now have a version that isn't you know, upwards compatible with other versions. 
So you could write applications for your version of X, but then others couldn't use those features easily. The graphics event library um, back there was pretty simple. It was a direct drawing uh, system. Um, what does direct drawing mean? We talked about this in the reference model um, about features of the graphics event library. There were a diff couple different modes in which the, the graphics event library could operate, and direct drawing was one of them. Any reminiscence? Simplest mode. So what's the simplest mode of the graphics event layer? If you, if you send it a drawing command, what's the simplest way for it to handle it? Any thoughts? Yeah? It works a little bit like paint, I guess. So it draws directly onto the desktop, and if something is moved or it, everything is redrawn? Well, yes and no. It draws directly. It, it, draws directly on, well, not necessarily desktop, but into the, the, the video buffer. Um, but if something gets covered and then later uncovered, it doesn't know what to do. It basically just says, oops, you know, I guess there was, was something there before and I don't know what it is. So the application, the higher levels, need to tell it again what to draw. So direct drawing is basically just, you know, draw the commands that are coming in and forget about it. So the higher levels need to do the buffering that make sure that I know what's inside my app window, <clears throat> even if it gets covered and then uncovered again. Um, that is actually something that the base window system then provides optionally. So while the graphics event library has no idea of, of buffering what it's drawing, it's not keeping a backup copy, so to say. Um, the base window system, next level up in X, does offer that feature optionally to, to applications. So if an application says, yeah, I want you to take care of you know, keeping track of what was on the screen if a window covers another window and then uncovers it again, then uh, you can ask the base window system to do that. The graphics event library also, in, in other respects, was built you know, typically for the time, if you like, so basic uh, pixel-based drawing, so a raster model, if, uh, which is what we called it. So you draw in, you know, whatever, 1024 by 768 pixels, for example. And if you wanted to uh, clip the content, um, you could only do that in rectangular ways. So no, like, fancy, non-rectangular shaped uh, windows on the screen, for example. The um, X server itself was also um, built as a simple single entrance server, so it was handling things in a round-robin fashion, uh, meaning that if an application sent, um, you could have running, you could have, you typically would have many X clients running, talking to the server, right? Because the server is sort of the thing that's rendering essentially your, your desktop, your, your entire GUI in front of you. So you've got a couple different, different apps running on it, and they would all be sending their drawing commands to you, and you would paint them. Um, but if one application sent a drawing command, then the server would go ahead and draw that, and when it's done with it, it would come back and say, okay, what's next? Again, this is probably how you would implement it if I asked you to write it right now. Right? It's the simplest, straightforward way to do it, handle each command as it comes in. But it also means if you send a really complex command that takes the X server a long time, everybody else is basically waiting for that to finish. <coughs> Um, and when we talked about the reference system, we, we saw some alternatives of handling that, right? Having multiple copies of the server running in multiple threads that could each handle things or, um, you know, just put locks on certain um, critical resources in that case that shouldn't be written to from two parts at the same time. You could actually, if you wanted to, even run multiple X servers on a single machine. Because it, it's just a user level, <clears throat> a user level process. Um, but that would be a pretty weird thing to do because you normally have the X server take over your display and run in full screen mode. So it's basically rendering the whole desktop background and um, putting all the applications into that. 
So here's the protocol of, of X and um, the, the client and the server talking to each other, what's happening across that network. Um, it's an asynchronous protocol. This is what I mentioned when I said like X was actually an improvement over its, its predecessor that had been done, um, the, the W window system, because that was a synchronous protocol that was always waiting, but even the client was not doing anything until it got a response back that the uh, command had been completed. Now at least the client can continue to do its thing. So you can send a drawing command off and then you can do some other computation and then you can send another drawing command off. You don't need for the drawing command to be finished before you can continue doing something else. So that's nice. Um, and that was a big performance improvement in X. Um, so it's an asynchronous protocol. It's basically just a byte stream going between client and, and server. Um, the transport layer like TCP would guarantee your order, uh, which you probably know from networking uh, classes. It was built on top of TCP, but theoretically you could use other uh, transport layers. Nowadays nobody remembers that there could be any other layers than and TCP basically. Um, and they measured that the overhead that the whole sort of putting a network in between client and server was creating was about 20%. So not too bad, right? If you were running a, an application locally and then you put sort of the network communication in between, uh, it wasn't making things magnitudes of times slower. Now, of course, those numbers from today's perspective should be taken with a grain of salt because both local computation has become much, much faster than 30 years ago and also network communication has gotten much, much faster. So you'd have to see what that works out to today. Um, this was a packet-based um, communication protocol. So you're sending packets along that say how long they are and, and you know, what kind of uh, resource IDs, for example, you're talking to. For example, a packet might say, um, please make the following base window um, you know, invisible on the screen or something. Um, so you need the ID of that resource of that base window um, to, to um, execute commands on it. And it they would have opcodes, so operation codes, very much like you know, you'd expect pretty much any normal protocol to do it. The uh, very first packet that's be, that gets sent is a little weird. Um, it, um, it's basically the initial way of the client, that application running on a mainframe, trying to establish a connection to the X server. So you have to imagine when you're writing an X, a client, an application that wants to do a GUI in X, what you first need to do is you need to, do, uh, you need to set up a network communication to your X server because it might be running on a different machine. Now, in practice, in the later years of X, Oftentimes, people would be running their X server and their X clients all on the local machines because you know, computers got much more powerful the kinds that you had on your desktop. But since the network communication was built into X as in, you know, in the, into the architecture, you always had to do that network connection, even if it was a local one. So that first packet was kind of an exploratory packet, right? It figured out, okay, so what is our byte order and, and, and what version of the protocol are we running and uh, do we require any authentication uh, from the server, those kinds of things. Once that connection was established, um, and that was a call, of course, that the client did um, by talking to the X lib, the, the X library, um, then there would be four typical kinds of packets. Uh, requests from the client to the server, for, for example, to draw something. Uh, be, sometimes you would get back, um, you know, you'd get the reply, uh, yes, this was drawn, although this was not something that the client was waiting for. Um, sometimes you get an error maybe if, for example, you ask for a huge base window system and the server said, sorry, I can't give you that because of maybe memory constraints or, or display constraints. Uh, and then, of course, there are events. So user moves the mouse or clicks the keyboard, the server needs to pass that on. So a typical thing would be um, client sends the first packet to the server, server accepts, hopefully, um, the connection, and then from then on, the client can use xlib um, API calls to actually um, talk to the server. So he'd send a request saying like, please draw the following graphical shape. Um, server would say, uh, a little later, I'm done. Meanwhile, the client could actually continue doing its thing uh, since it's asynchronous. Or it might request something and the server might say, meh, no, sorry, I can't do that. Or you'd have all these events coming in um, from the server. Which do you think, yeah, go ahead. Can the server buffer events? 
Um, so the way that this works is uh, yes, yes. So so the client. There's an interest, interesting way of, of making sure that the client can send events and also receive, uh, sorry, send packets and also receive packets. Um, the way that this works is every time the client did any call into the Xlib, so for example, um, you know, send a, send a request for drawing something or something, then um, the server would also get a chance because the Xlib had that built into its, into its packaging. Um, that the server would also be able to send events, for example, from its side. So then this would get buffered, and then the next time you would ask um, the xlib, is there a new event, then it would say if there's something in the queue or not. So those buffering in both, both directions was possible. But um, in the sense that the server, would, um, the server would still only process one event at a time. Right? So they would all be sitting there and waiting to be processed. Uh, so you could still um, slow down the, the system if you send a a very expensive command. Uh, which of the f of these event types that we're talking about here, or uh, that are again being sent over, or the packet types, do you think was the most frequent one? Yeah. Request reply. Um, depends a bit on the on the kind of app. It might be. Usually, it would probably come in more like a, as a close second. Depends on how busy the user is, in a way. So request reply, sure, every time you draw something uh, that comes up, and that, that might be a lot. But if you take, for example, a, I don't know, a word processing app or something, um, you're not actually doing that much continuous drawing. Yeah, maybe events. Yeah, sure. Uh, in, in most cases, it will be events because you're, you know, the user is constantly probably moving the mouse around, typing stuff, or doing things like that. So those would be the, the kind of most frequent things that would be happening. OK, so I was mentioning the Xlib a lot. And the Xlib, uh, usually if you were writing applications for the X window system as an application developer um, and as an app developer, you wouldn't worry much about the server, right? The X server would just be something that was running. and you don't care, really. It's a process that's running on some computer, maybe on the same one that your client is running on, or, or a different one. Um, you would be talking to the protocol stack, or the, the API stack, I should rather say, that you have on the client side. Um, so you're actually writing your application code for that mainframe in the basement. right? Um, and that has the xlib as the lowest level to talk to, and then it has two other layers above that. And these were making up. Um, the uh, UI toolkit, but also since we're now basically um, we're locally talking to a system and to the application, it almost looks like there is no network communication going on. When you look at an Xlib uh, or as an, at an X application, you don't constantly see network API calls. Right? You don't actually have to worry about that much. You worry about it once to set up the connection to tell the Xlib, and after that. You call the xlib function calls that are called things like you know draw a circle or something or get the next event and the xlib is the you know the the magic thing that packets that packages these things into network packets sends them off to the server gets replies back and does all the network communication so that's hidden from you after your initial establishing uh, establishing the connection yeah um, if you speak about networks um, <clears throat> in a sense that uh, you have a laptop where everything is on it so the client and the server yeah then um, we are still talking about the main network of, of the system so internally is there not a separate network but it is the the, the network yeah, that's it's also connected to the outside if there were no firewalls. yeah uh, iso osi level we're on level four like tcp right? we're talking tcp really and and you'll see this actually in the um in the first call that you do, the very first call you do into the xlib to establish that connection to the server is a call where you basically give it an IP address. You say, I want to talk to the following screen. You know, and that's screen. The IP address. Yeah. yeah. So it if it doesn't get an IP address from the an external route, is it? So what do you mean? Well if so so if if, uh, if we're in the same network, um, it should get an IP proper IP address. From the mm -hmm. speaking IP4, from the DHCP server, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. um, but if it is not connected, if it is connected to the outside, or it's, if it is in the same network, it should have an external IP address. Yeah. So 
remember, your computer, let's imagine you've got a laptop sitting in front of you and you actually want to run um, uh, an X server to, to look at input and output from com programs. But the programs you're running, for those, your laptop is too slow, so you're using a big mainframe computer or whatever, you know, cluster or something. So when you start your laptop, you would start an X server on your laptop. So now you have the equivalent of a, a desktop, let's say. Right? Um, and then you would, in that desktop, you would start um, launching clients. And if you launch that client, that client is actually running on that separate machine somewhere. Um, and what it needs to do to figure out where it, where it should be displaying is it needs to be told which server to render to. So it's typically a, uh, a command line parameter that you put in. That you put in. Right. So you'd say, dear server, you know, you know dear, dear um, mainframe computer, launch the following app. And this app is running on a computer that has an IP. Your laptop has an IP, right? Those are system-wide things that you don't need to worry about. So each of you has an IP, and the um, program on the, on the mainframe would launch. It would say, um, it would get a you know, command line parameter saying, connect to the following uh, X server, so to the following machine that is running an X server, and that would be an IP address and a port, for example, um, and then it would know, oh, okay, so the com program running here on this mainframe should actually render its output and receive its input from this computer over there. So these are real IP addresses. In, in the case where everything runs on its own computer, in, in one yeah. computer, then everything is local host and... Uh, yeah, exactly. It's, it's 127001 basically, yeah. But you would still have that um, network connection in there. So, so the XLib is basically implementing the X protocol on the client side. Um, every time it gets called, it, it checks if there are any packets that arrived from the server that contain events like mouse movements or keyword uh, pressing and creates, begins to create a queue on the client that then uh, you know, that then the application can uh, query and pull stuff out of. As an API, the XLib looks very much like a graphics and uh, event library to the app. That's why I'm saying it could be a little confusing because we basically have the XLib that on the client side looks like you're talking to the graphics event library because you're sending commands like draw circle or get next event, typical stuff that you'd expect from a graphics event library. But in reality, it's just a, a, you know, a wrapper around network communication, and the actual um, event processing and graphics drawing is actually happening somewhere else on the X server. So if you would like to say in a more abstract way, you can create, delete, modify resources on the X server. Those could be um, windows, for example, events, those kinds of things. <coughs> um, If you wanted to extend uh, the functionality that the XLib offers, for example, add a new command for drawing triangles, uh, you would actually have to change the code um, of the XLib and on both sides. Or the server would also need to know what that is. You'd have to invent a new uh, opcode for a new command that gets sent around. So that's a little uh, tricky because it makes your incompatible with earlier versions. The resources that the server offers, of course, are the typical things, and the things that the XLib thereby also offers to the client, uh, pix, pix maps, for example, or windows, or graphics context, color maps, um, fonts, and so on. One thing you will notice, and this is where sort of the, the magic of the, um, of the server connection is hidden, is that most calls into the XLib will have a first parameter, which is uh, the so-called display, and the display is actually sort of the uh, connection, the TCP IP connection, the socket connection to the server. Right? So that's where the network information is hidden. So once you, in your first call with the XLib, you say, uh, I would like to connect to the following computer with an IP address and whatnot, and then that gets put into a display variable. And that is a typical, uh, that is a, a particular kind of variable, which you can then refer to later on in every call and say, Oh, by the way, this call is meant for the following display, meaning the following laptop with, that's running the X server. That's where it should go. 
So that means you could even write an Xlib application um, that is talking to different servers. Right? I could run it on the mainframe. It could render something on your laptop. Could run to something else on your laptop if you were also running an X server. But that is a pretty unusual situation. Mostly, you'd have your client only render all its input uh, output stuff um, on one machine. What's much more typical is that one server will be talking to lots of clients, of course, because you're running all kinds of apps on your machine. So here's, um, I, I, I like to do this with, uh, w when I try to wrap my head around a new uh, kind of window system and I want to understand what does it feel like to work with this. Um, so I, I like to just look at sort of a, a basic Hello World kind of application that shows me the, the structure of what, what the code actually does. So this is C code. This hopefully doesn't scare anybody here. It's um, very straightforward to read. Um, but remember, X was written before sort of object um, orientation was um, uh, ubiquitous. And so we're looking at procedural code here. Um, first thing you notice is in X, you have to, so we're now writing an application on the level of the graphics event library, right? We're not using any fancy buttons or scroll bars or menu items and any widgets, any UI toolkit, nothing, none of that, right? We're just down to the very basics. So you include some header files that basically give you essentially the API of the X library, the Xlib. Um, so that gives you things like, you know, access to the API calls for drawing a circle or a line, for example, or receiving events. And then here we have the magical display variable that I was mentioning. So display is a, is a, um, is a type that is defined by the, uh, by the X library. Um, the asterisk just means it's a pointer, right? So it's a pointer to a data structure. Um, we also have a screen on there. That refers to the fact that even with X in the 80s, you could have multiple monitors connected to your terminal or your, your desktop. And if you wanted to actually um, run an application and have it talk to this monitor and have another one running on this monitor, uh, those would be distinguished by the screen variable. So screens were numbered from like 0, 1, 2, and so on. We have a graphics context, remember, that's the, um, I like to think of it as the palette, right, where I set the style of, of drawing or painting or, or rendering that I want to do. And we have things like a window and an event. So this event is called X event here. Those are typical data types that we already knew we could expect from the graphics event library. So the first thing you do um, when, when your program launches is that it would open a connection to the server. So here you say X open display. All the commands that are part of the Xlib start with the letter X. It's, it's easy to recognize. Um, and here we see the IP address I was talking about, right? And the uh, uh, colon zero here basically is the screen on that server running on that IP, at that IP address that I want to talk to. I pick the default, um, um, sorry, that's the, that's the display. That's the first X server running on it. The screen then is picked here by the default screen based on um, the display I just got. So I now know that I'm drawing to the screen that the X server typically wants to present things on. Um, and now I've established my connection. And now I don't need to worry about this anymore. But notice that all the other calls later on, D, 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 this comes up a lot, right? Even down here, drawing a line. Every time I do something, I tell the Xlib which server I actually want to do this on. Right? So I'm passing on this display variable a lot in every uh, procedural call. Now I'm creating a window. Remember, I'm, cr I'm telling the Xlib to create a window. It doesn't really create a window. All it does is it takes my, com my request, sends it over to the X server as an, a packet, uh, and the X server creates that window on the computer in front of the user. So this code running on the mainframe, right? Remember that? Um, and so here we have the display variable in here. Uh, we're telling it to use the default root window as, as its parent. So that's basically the, uh, the desktop, the screen background on that um, on that X, of that X server that is rendering. Uh, you pass in some um, X, Y coordinates and some width and height of how big you want that window to be. Uh, I haven't specified anything here. Um, you set what kind of border you want um, and you tell it what you would like to use as foreground and background color. So as foreground color, I'm using a, a defined uh, function here, which is the black pixel, with whatever the display considers to be a black pixel. If it's, for example, an inverse display, 
uh, that could actually in, you know, visually be, be white if it's a white on black display. Uh, so black pixel, white pixel goes in, and so those define the foreign background. And now we've created a window. So we've now created a resource in the X server that's running on you know, your laptop. We then say, oh, I want to actually um, map that window, which means um, to actually make it visible. So remember from the reference window uh, system, windows can be existing in the server as a data structure. You could draw stuff to them, but you could actually not show them yet. Right? You often actually want to do that if you have a lot of things to draw and you don't want the user watching you while you're drawing if it takes a long time. And then you show it at some point when the, the, uh, the drawing that you wanted to put in there is ready. Let's say you're loading you know, uh, a JPEG image over the net or something. You don't want people to watch you loading this over a slow connection. So you wait until it's done and then you show it as a whole. Um, so so that, that's, that gets it mapped. Right? The window um, off that, on that display gets mapped. Um, so it's visible now. Um, we haven't specified here how you set up the, uh, the graphics context and details, but at some point you would set up these values uh, of mask and attributes here um, and basically create a graphics context in the Xlib. So this is your graphics context then for your application. Remember the princess principle, right? This application thinks that it has its own graphics context. It doesn't need to worry about other applications rendering um, to the same server because the base window system makes it look as if I'm the only person doing that. So I've got a graphics context now. Um, and now I say, hmm, when I'm requesting um, events, first of all, I already know every time I pick up an event, Princess Principle, I only get events that were meant for my app. right? I don't get events meant for anybody else. Base window system takes care of that. But I actually want to filter it down even further. I, don't, I only want to know about two kinds of events. Exposure, which means my window just got uncovered. So this is one of those typical examples where the system tells you, hey, buddy, um, some other window just went away and exposed your window. And then the base window system might say, I don't know what to do if it isn't doing buffering, uh, so please repaint yourself. And in this case, the app needs to do the repainting. Um, the other kind of event I'm interested in, that's why it's linked with an OR here as a mask, is button presses. So um, did actually an event that arrived for my application include a mouse button press? So that's the mask that I'm setting up that I'm interested in listening for for events uh, on that window, on that display, so on that server. And then I'm running in um, you know, endless loop. Here I'm calling the next event X next event call. So that basically says, um, dear Xlib, please check your event queue that you've been filling up from the server with events coming in from the user um, and give me the next event um, off the, the top of that queue. Gets put into um, a data structure E, um, which, is in a, uh, which is an X event data structure. And then I look into the type part of that data structure and say, hey, what kind of um, event is it? I know it's only going to be exposure or button press because the X next event here, I set my filter for events that I want to receive back to only be those. So if the Xlib has other kinds of events, I'm not getting them for that window. So if it's an expose, which means actually there was just an uncovering of the window, I'm going to redraw my, my content. That will also happen the very first time the window gets created, right? Because then it's basically empty and doesn't know uh, what to do. It's exposed for the first time, you could say. And the amazing thing that I'm painting into my Xlib uh, window here is a diagonal line. Right? So going from typically XY in window systems is the top left, not the lower left as you have been trained to where you should put it from mathematics. Uh, window systems often put it at the top left. So on the display, on that window, with the graphics context that I've set up, at location X, Y, and, and uh, width and height, I'm going to be drawing a line. So I'm painting this line, um, and then I'm exiting the switch case. If I have a button press, on the other hand, I'm just exiting the program. And so that, at that point, I'm, I'm gone. I could have destroyed the resources on the server if I was a nice person. Didn't do that here. But those resources will probably go away as part of the um, fact that the uh, server loses the connection to this client because it just stops being there. So 
this is a very, very simple application that would be working even today if you compiled it and ran it on a, pro, on an, on a computer that's running an X server, you could run this kind of app. But it's kind of, you know, tedious, right? I'm drawing with lines and stuff. I have no widgets available. So let's look at how widgets are done. Again, X is a, um, sort of a great example of a layered in, uh, structure. You could really see that people were designing it that were trying to keep the architecture very clean and, 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 and separate and layered. Um, so even the widget set, or the user interface toolkit, I should say, is layered in two, um, two parts. The, uh, they, the thinking behind that was, well, we're creating a window system, but we don't really know how people want their widgets to, to look. Maybe somebody wants to design a widget set that is all 3D and fancy with shadows and stuff, and somebody else wants something very, very simple, straight and fast that doesn't use as many resources. So they made even the widget set exchangeable. Okay, so you can actually exchange the whole, what we would call the user interface toolkit um, in X. You can exchange the widget set. What stays is the XT intrinsics. Um, the XT intrinsics were basically generic functions that you will always need if you're working with widgets. So, and this was actually where you could see, starting with the developers that wrote X, they were beginning to think in an object-oriented fashion because a lot of things in there look like they're trying to do objects, but they can't really do object-oriented programming because they're working with C APIs. So a lot of it looks like you're trying to do object orientation. So what the XT intrinsics were offering were basically functions to implement an object-oriented widget class uh, hierarchy. So they create, contain things like create a widget or um, you know, destroy a widget or render a widget. Um, they were con containing basic functions for event processing. But they didn't specify exactly what the widget looks like. That happened in the widget set above that. So how do you write a, you know, how do you write a user interface toolkit and, and, a, and, and a widget library if you don't know what the widgets look like? Well, they did it basically as having very sort of generic resources. For example, every widget would have a border color, right? But it wasn't specified what that is or um, how you would draw that exactly. So the only thing that the XT toolkit intrinsics um, were defining were abstract meta classes. For example, uh, a simple widget was actually defined as an abstract class. Um, a container widget, remember the ones that, that can contain other widgets so you can lay out multiple widgets in a dialog, for example, um, that was defined as an abstract class in the XT toolkit. Or a shell widget. A shell widget was any widget that, was ren that would get rendered directly on the desktop. So the main document window of um, uh, an application running would be a shell widget because you could move it around on the desktop ind independently of everything else. Um, but something that gets rendered into that window, for example, menu bar that gets rendered inside a window, wouldn't be a shell widget. So simple, container, shell, those were abstract classes that were available um, and that are available in the XT Toolkit Intrinsics. The other thing that the Toolkit Intrinsics defined was sort of a life cycle of a widget. They said a widget can either be, uh, it has been created, so the data structure exists um, on the server, right? Um, it, it, it has been linked into the um, dynamic hierarchy, into the widget hierarchy of our application, so it knows what its parent is in our current interface. Uh, but there may not be a window associated with it yet. The next step would then be uh, that it gets managed. So if you, for example, create five buttons, and you put them all next to each other as children of a, a dialog box, right? They should all go at the bottom. Um, they may actually be too big to all fit into the dialog box if you gave the dialog box a particular size. So the moment you uh, manage a window, uh, a widget, sorry, it means that now the widget actually has been 
size checked and sort of put in place by its parent. So the dialog box uh, container says, okay, I'm only whatever, 100 pixels wide, so each of you only gets, I don't know, 18 pixels or so, so that there's a little bit of space between you guys. So then the size and also the position has been determined. This is for, for shell windows, this is also part of the policy that the window manager will have a say in too. And then, as I said earlier on, the data structure already exists, but now we are actually going to create a window uh, resource in the server. That's when you realize it. Um, realizing is the next step of a, uh, a widget's, uh, if you want, uh, life cycle. So now we have everything um, put in place. We've got the data structure that's been created in the Xlib. Um, we've got the corresponding base window system uh, window in the, in the X server. The, uh, the data structure in the Xlib in, in your client is actually set up so that it's connected to a parent, so everything is fine. The only thing that's missing it, um, it still isn't on the screen. For that, we go to the last state of the lifecycle, which is mapped. If I set a widget to being mapped, that says, I actually want this to show on the screen. Do you think it would be on the screen then, at that point? Or could you think of a way where it still wouldn't be visible? Yeah? As we are only um, in the X lib here, mm -hmm. I guess that um, Matt does only tell us that the command has been uh, sent to create the, the widget. Mm -hmm. it, it's, mm -hmm. not still, it, it's still not on the screen. Okay, so th that's a good point. If you talk about the uh, the client's view of things, the moment it, it sends a command in X map window, at that very moment, we don't know it's on the screen yet. In fact, it's probably not because it's going to take some time until that happens. Um, but that wasn't the difference I was, I was thinking of, although you're, you're perfectly right with that. Um, even if the state has been completed by the server and, and the, you know, the, the X server has set it to mapped and everything, it still might not be visible. Why? Yeah. Because some other window is in front of it, for yeah. example. Exactly. It might be covered by some other application. Uh, remember, this is the, you know, the, the princess principle. I'm thinking, all right, I'm on the screen now. I'm ready to go. But I don't know if some other window covers me. Mm -hmm. App application A has no clue that application B is partly in front of it. We don't know. Right? So that's important to realize as the um, you know, this abstraction that the base window system creates, that you don't need to worry about those things as an application. So all these functions exist. So you, there's a function, for example, XT realize widget, XT map widget, um, or all those kinds of things. Um, and they work with all kinds of widget classes that you create on top of uh, the toolkit intrinsics. It also does the event, uh, event dispatch. So meaning that uh, it defines the uh, <coughs> in Indian tool. Sorry, you have got a question? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. You, you said that events get, get uh, well processed even though they, they can't be shown on the screen. So uh, in this case, uh, wi wi a widget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. wouldn't save a lot of power or computation time if you check first whether they are actually active and then draw them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what you're talking about is the, the question, how do you optimize the rendering yeah. of I mean, things? Of course, it's easier to yeah. render them all the time, but right. if you have right. one big window that covers like its widgets, you kind of waste the... That's absolutely right. But we can actually do that, right? So let's say I've, I'm, I'm, I'm sending a paint command. Right? I'm painting a line or a circle. My application, my client code is going to say, you know, draw a circle. That gets sent to the, you know, I'm calling an xlib call to draw a circle. The xlib on the client side will have to do that. So send off the packet, send it over to the server. Now the server will get this in the base window system and will figure out, okay, uh, so application so-and-so is trying to draw a circle in those local coordinates. That means global coordinates is this and this, and it's on that window. At that point, you can then say, Oh, 
that window is actually currently behind this other window because the base window system knows this and it can do things like culling, um, you know, not drawing things that are already hidden. So you can save that drawing time, but you can only serve it once you're, save it once you're on the server side of things. In fact, if you, if you try to optimize that all the way up into your app's code, you would lose that nice virtualization, this princess principle, right? It would go away because then I would have to actually worry about is somebody else covering me or not. So on the event side, um, what happens is that um, the toolkit intrinsics actually have um, defined, for most events, they've defined translation tables. So the toolkit intrinsics have something that says, if a mouse, a mouse up event happens on a button widget um, or on a widget, then you know, trigger something like an activate call. One thing that is actually pretty well done in X, and this is something we're going to see differently in other uh, early toolkits, is that widgets will handle the events alone. So um, widgets in, in, in X, and this is why I'm saying they're already thinking a bit object-oriented here, um, are actually able to, if they get an event, trigger the corresponding action themselves. So you don't have to have uh, this event loop I was talking about um, uh, last time where you say, um, get the next event and, you know, uh, process it and get the next event, process it. We had to do this on the level of the xlib, yes, right, there were no widgets, right, there were only windows in the base window system and we had to do everything. So you saw the little code of the xlib had this endless loop as the main thing that was going on was get the next event and handle it, get the next event and handle it. Once you move on to working with widgets, um, in an object-oriented toolkit, you actually don't have to do that anymore. The widgets will handle most events themselves. How, if, if widgets handle events, like uh, a button, for example, when it gets, you know, clicked and released on triggers, how does the application then get anything done? What's the, what's the programming construct that you use to still do something in your app? For example, I don't know, exit the app if you, um, if you, if somebody happens to, you know, like click the put button. Yeah. yeah. Callback functions. Callback functions, exactly. So with callbacks, right? So at this point, anything that the app itself needs to do, any logic uh, happens in callback functions. And those callback functions, you need to register with the widget. So you need to tell a button, for example, um, hey button, if you get clicked and released, so if you get triggered, um, do the thing that you have to do, like invert and all that kind of stuff, I don't care. But also, please tell me, I'm a callback function, that this happened so that I can react. And so you would, for example, take the exit call, the, the, the exit callback that you write, which finishes your application and closes it, you would register that with the, the button that says exit or quit. So now on to the widget set. So we now have basically a, a generic structure in place that can create widgets that can handle events on a, on a very generic level. But we still haven't specified an actual look and feel of a widget set. This is what happens in this final uh, layer here, which, as I said, is also exchangeable. The programming model is defined in the XT intrinsics. Uh, we are now all we need to do is use the XT intrinsics functions and create a bunch of interface elements that we like. And that, together with the window manager that you use, together defines the, what the interface looks and feels like to the user. Okay, let's look at a really ugly widget set, okay? This is the Athena widget set because X was part of Project Athena um, and so they created an initial widget set and you got to forgive these people. They were, you know, developers in the 80s doing a graphical user interface. You know, what can you expect? So um, this is what it looks like. It's, it's very, very simple and basic, right? It was a quick throw. It's free. It's always available. Any X installation will have it. So uh, that meant that you could basically um, always use it if you're writing an X application. Um, and it was the original widget set. Very simple, about 20 widgets, which is not a lot by today's standards. 
drawn in essentially a 2D style, no strong sort of uh, 3D hinting here. Um, and there was also no um, strong associated style guide. So it didn't come with a you know, thick book that said, this is how you create beautiful interfaces with the X um, Athena widget set. That wasn't there. The prefix that you would see is XAW uh, for Athena widgets um, for all these um, classes. The first one that you had was a simple Athena widget set that was basically a direct ba uh, derivative of the simple uh, widget class that you had in the toolkit intrinsics. It just added a few resources uh, like a cursor and, and a pix map to use for the border. So how should the border be painted? Then int the interesting ones, well, interesting is maybe a little uh, overdoing it. Um, the, the standard ones that you would get are things like a label, uh, we talked about the, and that's usually the simplest widget that you can find is one that you can just put some text into, um, maybe put a border around it if you want to. Um, then you'd have things like a, um, um, a, a toggle button that you could press and, um, uh, and unpress, a, uh, a menu button that would actually be able to be hooked up into a, a drop-down or pop-up menu, um, lists, in this case, actually, lists were defined as things that could be in two-dimensional, so it could be rows and columns of, of these things. Um, a radio button, where you can only trigger one at a time. A scroll bar, you know what that is. Um, even things like a little uh, form widget. So, for example, to um, create, to lay out things in, a, in, in, in rows and columns. So that would position things relative to each other. You could say, I want you know, B to be to the right of A, and I want C to be below B. So the form widget itself would not contain these, right? These are three children that have been placed into it. Or a dialogue widget, in which you could place, for example, the text widget and, and a, button, a bunch of buttons. That's basically just a special version of the form widget uh, to use for dialog boxes. There are also some widgets that uh, I'd like to mention here just to show you that this is sort of the, 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 the Cambrian explosion of, of interface widgets, right? A lot of stuff was invented, tried out. Some of it didn't survive. Um, so this is more of a curiosity show. Uh, we've got one um, button, for example, here that was called a repeater. That's a push button that if you hold it, keep holding it down, keeps triggering events, very much like a keyboard re uh, repeat that you have on a, on a keyboard. Um, the panner was a um, kind of a 2D scroll bar, so you could move this thing in this direction and this direction. You actually might see this today. Have you seen something like this? I'm going to show you what it does. Uh, it was often linked to a porthole. A porthole is basically a view um, onto a larger canvas that you could scroll over in two directions. Yes? This is used in like image previews and some, some ads and so on. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you often see that in uh, moving this thing around would actually pan over the contents that you're seeing through this portal. Yeah. Uh, also, if you press the third mouse button to scroll in some applications. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Then you get the sort of, uh, that's just a 1D scrolling, but you get the sort of preview of what's, what's happening, uh, showing you a uh, part of it, yes. Strip chart, right? You actually had a widget to draw strip charts. Um, nowadays, you usually rarely find this as a standard widget in the widget set. It's typically something the applications have to define for themselves. Um, viewport is not so, so unusual. It's basically just giving you um, um, a, it's kind of like a porthole with scroll bars, right? It's a constrained widget that, that only shows part of the content. And that's typical for something that you would use today uh, when you were displaying uh, content in a window. And funnily enough, there was even a widget to lay out things as a tree. I guess they were computer scientists that like trees, so they made a widget for it. Um, or a gauge. Uh, a gauge is actually you know, this kind of um, thermometer-like display here that you could mark with tick marks and names on them and, and have, have render. So you can see there was a bit of confusion in the early days between like what are going to be widgets that every kind of application will need and what are things that are pretty sort of application-specific, domain-specific, that maybe we shouldn't put into the overall widget set. Okay, things got a little more beautiful uh, with the motif uh, 
uh, widget set or the, yeah. So Motif was a complete user interface toolkit that was um, done by the Open Software Foundation, which was neither open nor a foundation. Uh, it was uh, closed source and commercial. Um, but it did provide a much, much nicer uh, 2.5D uh, widget set that was kind of following the designs of the times. This kind of looks, um, you know, like Windows 95, the kind of stuff. Um, they had more than uh, 40 widgets available and um, became the industry standard for X. So X, obviously, you know, Unix being a rock-solid operating system was in, in widespread use uh, in companies. And um, you know, X looked like a great way to add graphical user interfaces to Unix rather than having to throw all, all those computers and replace them with Windows machines. Um, so X was running a lot on those machines. And if you then wanted to write a commercial grade industry level app, you would use the Motif toolkit so that the apps looked kind of polished and, and had a neat, neat look and feel. Um, Motif came with a style guide, it came with a user interface uh, design language, it had all these bells and whistles, and as you can see, um, a much more sort of uh, refreshed and, and sort of uh, usable, usable look to it. There was even a, um, uh, its own window manager. So, because when you think about it, the, the uh, widget set is now defining the look and feel of what, what stuff looks like inside the apps. But you would like the decoration that gets drawn around Windows to be, to match that, right? So you kind of had to write your own window manager alongside with the user interface toolkit if you wanted to provide a complete experience that was, was co coherent. So um, that's why there was its, uh, the own, its own, it had its own window manager. And here's an example of the um, motif widget set. So you can see these things um, look a little more like what you might be um, recognizing as sort of a typical 90s style. Um, all of them start with the XM um, prefix that was in a way, uh, you know, the, the early way to mark um, function calls to belong to a particular library before we had nice object-oriented namespaces and stuff. The primitive widgets, uh, the simple widgets, were called XM primitives, and uh, that was again a, an abstract class. Um, and in there, you had things like the the XM label to to just put uh, you know put text underneath something, um, the XM text widget that would that we used for for editable text, or the XM separator which you would use to divide things uh, um, among each other, uh, an XM scroll bar that looks kind of like this. Um, and then you'd have shell widgets, so all the things that go on uh, on on the uh, on the on the desktop, talking to the window manager. Right? These would be the only ones that the window manager would go ahead and decorate and put stuff around. So they're all direct children of the root window. Remember the tree we drew uh, one day when we were thinking about like how could this be represented as a tree? Everything that's directly on the desktop is a is a child of the root window. And there would be shells for applications, which are main document windows, or pop-ups like dialogues. Um, those would be different kinds of shells that get decorated differently by the window manager. And then finally, it provided a whole bunch of very useful um, layout widgets um, or container widgets um, that were named under the, sim uh, under the abstract class XM Manager. And those could be um, drawing areas where you could do anything you wanted. You just get an X canvas and you paint on it anything you want or things like a row column widget that would lay out stuff in rows and columns for you. So if you had to arrange um, lots of windows and, for example, to make this dialog here, you would probably use a row column widget and you know, create it with maybe two rows and the first row would have one, two, three, four uh, columns. Then you would maybe have to group this as a second row and this is a third row, each with its uh, number of columns. Motif went far enough to also create things like, for example, a file selection box. Right? Whenever you wanted to open a file, you got a dialog that you could call in the Motif widget set, so you don't have to build your own. So this was probably, um, you could say, the first really useful widget set that you would you know, like to build applications with. Um, and it created a nice, a nice um, user experience for people to uh, create apps on. By the way, while we're talking, um, passing around um, for historical um, 
amusement. Uh, an example of the, uh, the motif style guide. Not so much because we expect you guys to learn it by heart, but really uh, so that you can see this is a typical style guide document that basically describes all the uh, widget classes that you provide in a widget set and tells you what to do with them and how to use them, what they do. Now, of course, this was a little more relevant when people started doing graphical user interface because nobody knew what a scroll bar was actually supposed to do exactly. Nowadays, that's much more common sense. Um, but it's still important to understand how to use widgets. And to this day, you often see, for example, websites that use a, a, an editable text field to display some text that's not supposed to be edited. Um, so those kinds of things are still necessary to, to tell application developers. Um, let's look at how you program in X once you have actually a widget set. So things get much nicer now. We're still including the, the X library uh, as we did before, but we're also in including the, the intrinsics and you know some, some utility classes that are not so important. And here we import all the headers from Motif. And uh, the push button would actually be included by the motif header anyway, but we mention it so that readers of the code can see which classes we're actually using. Um, and this code falls into two parts. It has a callback function up here and the main function up here. Um, let's look at the main function. Um, here, we're creating two uh, widgets, uh, a top level widget. This is going to be the one that's directly on the background. That's the one that the uh, window manager will talk to and decorate. And then inside that top level widget, that container widget, will be a push button. So not a super interesting interface, but hey. The top level widget gets created using a call into the XT toolkit intrinsics. So this is not specific to motif. It's a general call um, that just creates a root level uh, widget that is a direct child of the, of the root window. Um, and it gets the name that we got passed into our, our argument vector here, which is the name of the program. It has a name um, that is also used as a resource identifier so that in, in a separate um, text file we could specify, for example, colors and, and, and fonts to use in this interface. This is late refinement, right, using an, a text uh, file, which we're not seeing here, um, to specify these kinds of variables. And then a bunch of other stuff that we don't care about too much. Um, but this XT initialize goes into the toolkit intrinsics. The toolkit intrinsics in turn call the X library and um, make sure that we are able to create a connection to um, the X server. The arguments, uh, the further arguments that are passed in here get passed onto the XT initialize call, which for example would be a way to specify which server do I want to connect to, right? Because I still need to tell uh, the code where my server is running. And then all we do is we use a, a convenience function from Motif to create a push button um, with the look and feel that Motif provides as a child of the top level. So here's the parent of the push button. It's the top level widget. Um, it has the name push button in our resource file as an identifier to set its text or, or um, to set its color and stuff like this. Um, and then we manage that child. Managing, uh, uh, managing means, as we just said, uh, it gets sized, positioned by its parent window. So now the push button is um, not just part of the widget tree, but it's also been sized and, and positioned accordingly. And now comes the interesting part that we talked about. The, um, the callback function needs to be registered. The push button needs to know what to do when it gets pushed, apart from inverting and that kind of stuff. So here we call another toolkit intrinsics function that is called add callback. So which widget are we adding a callback to? To the push button. What kind of uh, callback do we want to register? Because remember when we talked about what kind of things should a button be able to trigger, we didn't just say trigger when you're, when you're pressed and release, but also when, for example, a mouse enters the push button area or leaves it to display maybe a tooltip. So we are actually hooking this callback into the activate callback, which is, gets called the list of things that you add in this uh, in this list gets called when the button actually gets depressed uh, and, and starts um, and triggers for sure. And the function that we want to hook in is the exit callback, exit CB up here. So now the push button knows which, button, uh, which function to call when it gets triggered. Then we realize the top level widget. Realizing, remember, means we tell the X server to create it for real, 
to uh, allocate the resources and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we ent by, by default, these widgets are also then mapped. Um, and we enter the main loop. And interestingly, the, um, the main loop is a function in the toolkit intrinsics. So you don't see an event loop processing happening here. Right? There's no event loop processing code in the client app, which is a good thing, because you don't want to write that code every time you write an app. So instead, the uh, toolkit intrinsics take over that role and handle events for you. It knows by now what your widgets are, what kind of actions to trigger when a widget gets an event of, of a certain sort, so it can do all this. So you, basically, your main function jumps into this main loop and never returns from here. At some point, the user will actually, so, so everything's on the screen now. It's ready to listen to events. Before you call this, no event processing is happening. But the moment you call this, your, your app is live. And at some point, the user will click on that button. When he does, um, the hooked in callback function, exit callback, exit CB gets called. And that basically gets passed in, hey, uh, what widget am I uh, hooked into? Um, is there any client data that I need to pass on and um, any other callback structure? This is not too critical to understand what's going on here. The, cru the crucial thing is that we're now being a little bit of a, of a nice person. We're actually closing the uh, display. So we close the connection to the server. And that basically removes the resources that the server had allocated. And then we exit the program. So your program exits up here. So that these, these steps are basically the things that you often actually find when you write modern applications in, uh, uh, with, with uh, GUI toolkits. You initialize some sort of uh, connection or library or, or graphics context, etc. Uh, you kind of create your widget tree. You build the dynamic widget hierarchy. Remember, dynamic versus static, objects versus classes. Um, you register your callbacks. You make everything sort of sensitive for input and visible. And then you basically send event processing off to uh, the toolkit. All right, so that's programming using the, uh, the whole widget set. Now, the window manager that we talked about is in, in X is something pretty spe uh, special. It does a lot of the things that we would expect, right? It, it does the decor decoration around windows. It communicates with apps uh, by placing hints into the X server so they have this sort of shared memory kind of um, shared resources communication going on. There's no direct, um, I wouldn't call the window manager in X directly from an app. Um, they would communicate by resources that are being shared. Um, it implements the look and feel uh, policy and uh, supports late refinement um, in the sense that you can load resource files at runtime uh, to change the look of your application. And we can exchange it at runtime. So that's the most fun thing about the window manager, that you can kill it and run a different one. Um, and for that, I'm going to ask my uh, trusty assistant, Sebastian, to uh, take over and, and show you a bit of uh, fun with X. So what will uh, X is still um, available for all kinds of platforms, of course. And if you... Um, install a modern um, operating system, a Unix-based operating system, you actually, you can get X to run, but it, by default, it uses its, its successor, which we'll talk about next, which is Wayland. Um, so Sebastian went through a couple hoops to get a clean installation of X on a, on a computer that's, uh, that's Linux-based. There we go. There we go. Okay. So do okay. you want to talk about how did you get to this? Well, basically, what you see here is just a FreeBSD that just started up. Um, and of course, as BSD is typically a server operating system, there is no GUI yet. Um, what I've installed is XORG, so basically the open source implementation of um, the X window system. And we will just uh, run this now by uh, typing in the command start X. So there we are. This is the X window system. And what is running here is Tom's window manager. It's not very functional. It's actually pretty basic. 
So what you see here are like three different Xterm windows. Xterm is basically a terminal emulator and every one of these things is running in its own process. So can, I can probably now just type in something in like the NOAA thingy and use probably the best program ever, which is XIs. You know, the program XIs is now sort of started and it wants me to position a window. So um, there's this little wireframe here, I will click at some point and there they are. The XIs that follow my, my mouse cursor. Um, I can also scale them, so I use this button and scale them. As you can see here, um, this is very basic. It was at the beginning times of X, so people had to save performance, and that's why while I'm positioning or repositioning or rescaling, the windows are actually not wrong to sort of save communication and resources, and only when I lift, they will be repositioned. There's also some nice clock here, but um, let's have a look at the policies that this window manager implements. So this window manager has a... We should say, maybe just as an inter interjection here, now this is the case that we were talking about where we're running the X server on Sebastian's laptop, but we're also running all the clients on his laptop. Yeah. We wouldn't have to. We could, I could run the client on my laptop and talk to his X server if I wanted to, but we're doing everything on one computer for now. So I'm just going to type in something, and as you see, I, as I move my mouse cursor, sort of the input changes into a different window, which is probably very un uh, unconventional for today's standards, but it was implemented like that. So the um, window manager, of course, provides the decorations and it allows me to rearrange windows. It also adds some menu so I can sort of add more external windows or I can iconify stuff, make it smaller. So this is like a nice dot image of the previously devil. So but probably my favorite, um, well, program in X is the X kill command. So what you see is my mouse cursor is now this little death icon and I'm just going to kill this X term here and boom, it's gone. Um, maybe we should also sort of kill the window manager and see what happens. So we exit this window manager and as you can see, the iconified window becomes a regular window again because yeah the without a window manager there's no one to implement the policy of this but my um, mouse cursor still creates focus and I can still type in into the single X term windows and also the XIs are still wobbling yeah nice but what you can't do for example is you you couldn't click on this window here and bring it to the foreground right no. because that is something that the window manager would have to be around for yeah no longer possible so maybe we just start a new window manager. And uh, as a contrast program, let's use this DWM, and it's a tiling window manager. So now all my windows were repositioned and are now sort of tiled, which is also nice. If I sort of close one of these um, X terms, uh, probably it will, I don't know, rescale. So there it is. Also, um, this window manager um, supports different virtual desktops. You can see this in the upper left corner. But probably DWM, still very basic, not that nice to look at. Let's just close it. And um, So what, what you also notice is that, for example, um, the clock isn't, as an application, isn't specifying that it always needs to be square. right? So the window manager could just implement its policy, which is I want to fill, you know, always fill the maximum available screen without overlapping any windows, so it just painted the, the clock into the lower right-hand corner and stretched it. Maybe let's launch the uh, Motif window manager, and it was mentioned in the slides, it's called MWM. And there we are in the world of Motif. Again, uh, very basic, uh, it allows resizing. You see these nice decorations. Um, foreground window has this turquoise color, and you can still, um, you have some menus here, you can sort of size and move windows and you can also maximize them and make them smaller again or iconify them. Um, yeah, let's maximize it again. Um, also, another thing that the window manager um, adds here is this li uh, tiny sort of preview. It will tell you um, at which position you are repositioning the window.
And we're also seeing something interesting here, um, if you want to bring the excise to the foreground again. Mm -hmm. um, here we actually have already see support for non-rectangular clipping regions. Right? So the excise are actually able to cut out part of the underlying window, and it's not rectangular. So that, that is a little more advanced to do than just having rectangular um, areas on the screen. Can you click behind the eye or behind um, the rectangular thing? Yeah. yeah. So I guess you could even click between the eyes and you bring can the even window. Click between the eyes, yeah. And bring that window to the foreground. So. so. And of course, as you see, the Motif Window Manager, manager implements a yeah, click to focus policy. So if I want to type in something in this um, lower left window, I will first have to click it. It will become the foreground. So basically, just as we know it from um, today's operating systems. Although this, this whole uh, click to type versus focus focus pointer, these two policies are actually not that black and white these days. If you go in, I think, modern versions of Windows and Mac OS, if you go to a background window, you don't click on it to bring it to the foreground, but you can use the scroll bar on it, right? So scroll bar events get passed to a non-active window rather than to the active window, which is a kind of interesting if you use your scroll wheel on your mouse, right? Um, so there's, even today, there's a back and forth between should I have to bring a window to the foreground to execute events on it, or should it actually listen to events, although it's not the topmost window, not the active window. So now here you see the ice window manager, also very nice. It basically imitates the look of Windows 95 currently. It has this sort of start menu here, and the interesting part is probably that it um, has some settings. So on one hand, it is able to change the focus policy at runtime, but on the other hand, I can also sort of give it a new look. And yeah, now our window manager looks pretty nice. So as you see, sort of the window managers basically uh, implement most of these convenience methods that we have nowadays that sort of allow us to yeah, interact with our windows. Here the XIs also um, have no window decoration because the window manager is able to understand that there are windows that shouldn't have a decoration. Um, it's also interesting, I mean, we, we're not really, we don't really have any applications running here that have a lot of widgets inside, right? If we were running a Motif application that had all these, like, Motif drawn buttons in it, then it would look really strange to use a different window manager because then you got a lot of inconsistency, right? So if you, once you use applications with a lot of widgets from one kind, you also want a window manager to go along with that. Also, now you can see that we have a live resizing of apps here. So they are always drawn if they, while they are resized, and also I can reposition them and uh, get the immediate um, yeah, result. So close it. And maybe as a, less, a last step, let's have a look at <coughs> GNOME, which basically also runs on X Bell. And what you see is now, well, Basically, window, uh, window decorations that sort of match today's standards. There's also some taskbar at the top, and it has sort of to, uh, support for sort of showing an expose of all open applications, support for virtual desktops, and um, it also implements stuff like this dock here. And it comes with own apps, so I can sort of open the calculator app here, and it is working because it sort of provides its, yeah. UITK and apps, so let's play the uh, Sudoku game. Yeah, easy mode. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this sort of shows you that there are different evolutionary steps and the window manager became more and more complex and uh, this is basically the final thing that we saw like in the early 2000s. Um, Gnome and KDE still running on top of X. Um, yeah. Um, as the, uh, as the underlying window system. Nowadays, sort of, we sort of have larger requirements towards the, what we expect in terms of graphics system. It should be vector-based and everything, and we want more graphical effects. And this is sort of why typically these systems nowadays run on Wayland. And this is exactly what we will have a look at next. So let's uh, kill the GNOME again. Uh, Kill the gnome, yeah. Kill the gnome, kill the gnome. And boom, we're back to X. So <laughs> All right.
Thank you. All right. So um, for Wayland, uh, this is the sort of the uh, follow-up. What, what we're going to be doing the next couple of weeks is oftentimes um, show you a trajectory of, of a window system, how it started out, and then how it developed over the, the course of sort of technical changes and, and what it looks like today. To give you guys a feel for how um, the architecture adapts and, and modernizes itself in response to you know, what's happening in the world of technology. Um, Wayland similarly uh, found that, okay, so X designed in the, pipe, uh, in the 80s, the rendering pipeline was very simple, you know, pixel based. Um, windows were initially really only rectangular areas. Um, what we saw there later with the non-rectangular clipping regions, that's what also uh, was already in um, a modernization. Uh, and they found that a lot of uh, modern clients needed um, more advanced drawing, uh, ways of drawing. So the way they did that was they're no longer trying the, to have the X server do all that. I think maybe we should close. Is, is it this window maybe? This window. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, no longer trying the X server, uh, X server to do that, but they would move these things into client-side libraries and basically do rendering on their side um, and then just passing the, the resulting image basically down to the X server, saying like, I'm going to, just going to draw into this canvas and not use the X server's drawing capabilities in, in any more advanced way. So that makes the X server lose one of its core uh, tasks, really being the graphics event library. Um, and so examples for that would have been, uh, for example, Cairo, um, a, a vector-based uh, graphics API that was running on top of, of X. There's also the expense of communication, right? When you uh, look at X being designed as a distributed system, we saw every graphics call would go over a network connection, even if it was a local one. Um, and that was okay as long as interfaces and the graphics we were drawing were relatively simple. You know, basically saying one pixel belongs to one app. Uh, and only the topmost app gets to decide what that pixel looks like, right? I could say this rectangular area or maybe the round area of the, of the uh, X eyes. I know that whatever is shown on that pixel on the screen is only determined by the X eyes app or by the X term app. How is that not the case anymore when, with modern window systems? Can you give me an example? Um, in you know, your modern day desktop when you look at that, where a single pixel on the screen, what it looks like is actually influenced by more than the one foreground application. Yeah? And with Windows you can look through. Yes. So, so windows that have sort of a transparency to them so that you can see the other window behind them. Um, and that's, yeah, everybody kind of like tries that out when you first discover it and then you're like, okay, this is kind of cool but not really very readable. So you turn it off again. But there's another effect that everybody's using all the time that's also creating that same issue that one pixel is no longer just controlled by one app. What do you have just around, look at if you have a laptop open, look around the Ex, you know, external frame of a window. What's just outside that frame? Yeah? The shadow. Yeah, the, the, the drop shadows, right? So the shadows that one window is casting is actually a compositing effect, right? So we need to know what's beneath it. So we're showing some kind of, you know, content. The, the frontmost window at that point is normally would be that, that window that's half covered but we also have a drop shadow that's outside the other window uh, that's being cast on it. So we are dealing with, with 3D, uh, no, not 3D, but with, with compositing of multiple layers and trying to determine what color is this pixel and to determine that we need to look at multiple windows that are responsible for its color. What's especially tricky, um, th those kinds of things already, like drop shadow and stuff, require a lot more computation right, going on and all that going into the X uh, over the X protocol was kind of expensive. But especially expensive uh, were things that were going more into the direction of 3D um, effects. For example, trying to display um, you know, an effect of a, tr a window that turns on a cube to swip swap to another window. Um, that requires coordinate transformation that only the window manager really can do. 
Um, and that introduced even larger communication overhead because now you had to go to the X server and communicate with the window manager over those shared resources. The window manager would have to do its thing. Um, so that's, that's an expensive thing to do. So here's an example of that. Um, this is a uh, somewhat modern version of um, a, a desktop that you could render on, on, uh, on X that was basically rendered on a cube. So as you were switching from one you know, uh, virtual desktop to the next, you would see these things on a, on a cube. Um, even when you turned this cube some uh, halfway, these windows were still clickable. But what about the coordinate system here? You have to map the 3D coordinates now into a 2D screen coordinate, right? Uh, what happens when I click on the window inside that cube? Um, the window manager is just an app, so it can't do the coordinate transformation by itself. So the window system always ha will have to ask the window manager for every click, uh, where is that window? And then it will have to do the coordinate transformation and tell the client window. So for example here, what we have is sort of we have this turned desktop that's you know, slanted to the side, looked at from the side. Inside that desktop we have a window and now the user is clicking on that. But what we're really drawing on the screen is in this flat 2D coordinate system. Right? So there needs to be coordinate transformation happening right? to determine, um, okay, the mouse cursor in 2D is here, but what does that mean um, in screen coordinates? This is maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.5, if we assume a normalized coordinate system here, right? That's 0 0.5, 0 0.5. But in desktop coordinates, if this is the desktop here, that would actually be more like a 0.2 in this direction and 0.5 in that direction, right? It's, it's halfway down the blue uh, screen and a fifth down the depth of this, this slanted blue screen. Um, so, so the window system doesn't know that, right? So the window manager who's uh, maybe been told to slant these windows uh, would have to know. So there's a lot of communication going on. Uh, you basically, in X, we're looking at, uh, as an example, for, uh, the following kind of communication. Um, you've got your application, the X client. Um, <coughs> you've got your server running here on the, on, uh, the computer uh, the user is in front of with the, the hardware and the kernel. And we've got the window manager who's now becoming more of a compositor. So let's say the, uh, the user clicks the mouse. So the kernel needs to pass an event into the X server. Sure, it's a mouse click. The X server now needs to determine which window the, effect, the event affects and, and send it to the corresponding um, client, right? So it says, all right, I know normally um, it's this window, so it goes to the X client. The client then returns to the X server and says, oh, this was a click on a checkbox, and this checkbox was uh, just inverted from, from you know, blank to, to checked, so please draw the checkbox new in this following base window system window um, and uh, change its status from off to on. Now we're done with that. Um, the X server then sends um, a damage request um, to the compositor. You know, maybe some part of the screen was just uncovered. Uh, compositor receives the damage request um, and needs to recomposite the part of the screen that, where that window is visible because maybe in a modern system with like shadows and, and drop shadows and, and, and transparency effects, uh, we can't just draw an X on that side. Maybe we need to actually composite that new with the background that was there before. Um, and that, that's still behind the, behind the uh, check uh, box now. So at that point then, the X server receives the rendering request from the compositor to say, for example, uh, please copy the, uh, the compositor back buffer to the front buffer, um, and then we're, we're finally done. So there's a lot of stuff going on to do something like checking a box and drawing the visual effect that that is uh, associated with if you have a compositing modern interface where multiple windows actually influence a single pixel. The final thing then is of course that the server goes down and, and, uh, and actually draws that. So that's a lot of stuff going on in X, right, if you do it that way. And that was one of the reasons why Wayland was introduced. So Wayland basically um, made a couple tough decisions. Um, it decided that the um, window system and window manager, first of all, are going to get merged. 
so that you don't have all this back and forth between the window system, the base window system, and the window manager that we just saw. And the second sort of <clears throat> hard decision was to remove the network transparency. So you can no longer run Wayland as a distributed window system. But, you know, since the 80s from to the 2000s, we'd seen that desktop computers have gotten way fast enough and that rendering the GUI was usually so expensive that the application uh, client running was actually not a big deal for the desktop that you have in front of you. So it really shows kind of a different frame of mind, right? Back in the 80s, people still thought the heavy number crunching is happening on the mainframe. And then we have a little bit to do to draw the interface. And it's a graphical interface, but still, it's not a big deal. And nowadays, you know, a lot of the GPU power goes into drawing all these alpha blending effects and drop shadows and, and um, animated uh, resizings and so on. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So the Windows system is supposed to be local. The, the X server does not exist anymore as a separate structure. So in this, in, in Wayland, if we look at the same task, um, the, of, of, you know, like checking this box and seeing what the composite needs to do, it looks like this. The kernel gets the event um, that, um, you know, the, the checkbox was, that that was an event that the button was clicked. So that's similar to X, um, so it's compatible. So any input-output drivers on this level, um, you could actually reuse right? in, in that direction. Um, Wayland doesn't look different than X. It then checks the scene graph um, and figures out what's on the scene. So the compositor knows the transformations and uh, just basically inverts the, the transformation to figure out where that uh, click needs to go, picks the right window that should receive the event, then sends it onto the client, um, the client says, oh, okay, it looks like you clicked on my checkbox. Um, and then the client basically says, um, I'm going to update my uh, UI um, in the, and, and that updating happens directly in the client. The client just informs the compositor what region was updated. And then the compositor says, okay, so it looks like this client just had its uh, checkbox here checked so it knows there's a tiny area that needs to be restructured because maybe there are blending effects, alpha effects that we now need to recompute. So the compositor collects any damage requests and recomposes the screen, um, including any fancy 3D effects. Right? So if, for example, there was a, I don't know, um, a, a mirroring effect or something on that checkbox, um, then you would have to, of course, also recompute that new. new. Um, but that is much, much simpler now that uh, the Wayland compositor um, you know, summarizes the window manager and the window system, and we don't have to do network communication anymore. So you could say, in a way, it was a little bit of a uh, X giving up on its, its roots of uh, being this you know, fancy, nicely layered, architectured, uh, separated window system. But on the other hand, it was basically just following what, it, what you could see in the commercial window systems happening at this time. And so Microsoft Windows, um, Mac OS, those are all Windows systems that are much more integrated, more tightly. They don't allow any network transparency of the way that X does. Um, and they're able to render these much more interesting and, 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 and fancy effects that you expect from a modern desktop. So not to be left behind, X kind of had to adopt that uh, architecture. So Wayland got much faster. Um, it uses a direct rendering approach in which you um, share graphics memory between clients and compositors. Every app renders into, directly into its own um, memory buffer. And the compositor then uses those buffers to draw um, and, and rearrange them as needed. So the only, time, uh, the only thing that the client needs to tell the compositor is which buffer it's using and, and, and when and where it has rendered any new content. And then the compositor can go in um, grab all those buffers and recomposite the screen. This is necessary if you want to do something like uh, even something simple as, as, as drop shadows. Right? You need to know from everybody what are you drawing and then you need to compute the resulting image as a whole. This also um, allowed another development to be uh, done much more, not, much more easily because 
um, 3D APIs were becoming more and more prevalent in the 90s. Uh, and by the 2000s, they were ubiquitous for gaming and so on, but also for like, scientific programming and visualization. Uh, best example is OpenGL. And so OpenGL as a, as a graphics um, API to draw 3D scenes. And OpenGL in X was really tricky because X had no idea what OpenGL is, but OpenGL was basically a very fundamental drawing engine. So it was kind of standing beside the, the normal Xlib functions. So what, you, what did you have to do? You had to grab a canvas uh, in the server, say, give me a canvas, I'm, I'm just going to paint in it. And then on the client side, you'll be doing all your OpenGL computations and render everything out, and then take the resulting image and send it down to the server. So again, you're not really using the drawing functions in the X server anymore. You're just piping down full frames, pretty much. So not very nice. Um, so that would be sort of like your software version of it. If, but if you wanted to use OpenGL with the uh, speed up of the graphics card that's sitting in you know, your laptop in front of you, the running the X server, then there was no way to do that, because you were just sending it images. So if you wanted to use that, then you had to sort of send the OpenGL commands down to the server and somehow reach into the server and, and use the OpenGL commands there. So that's kind of tricky. Um, the Wayland architecture allowed much easier access to things like OpenGL acceleration. So that was one other reason why um, Wayland was the way to, to go. But it doesn't throw away X completely if you still had an X client compiled you know, against the X library, X11 library, uh, you could still run that. Because one of the things that uh, you can run in, in Wayland is called X Wayland. And X Wayland is an X server implementation um, with a couple changes that allows you to run your X client applications on Wayland using the uh, X Wayland server. So it's kind of like a backwards uh, compatibility um, emulation, if you like. So, for example, that X server then would use Wayland input devices and, and forwards its own root window that, that it has, um, or even individual top-level windows, as Wayland surfaces, which then the compositor can make use of and just use as if this was just another application rendering something. And Wayland, but Wayland handles all the presentation of the windows. So um, you're not running uh, your own window manager here anymore. Okay, so that's X. Um, Overall, I think we've seen a nice example of you know, an AT system designed in a very architecturally clean fashion, what kind of advantages you get from that, how it gives you a lot of flexibility to exchange anything and everything about it, um, and then the move to a more modern, more sort of homogeneous, but also more monolithic approach, Wayland, which is also the way that all the other big commercial window systems have gone since. We're now going to take a look at another system that has gone through a, you could say, similar uh, iteration. But while X is an example for a window system with strong separation of all the layers, we're going to now uh, take a, an even further step back into, in history. Uh, what was the first graphical user interface, desktop, windows, icons? You all know this from DIS1, of course. Any guess? Mac. The Mac was the first commercially widely sort of successful one, but there was one shortly before that that kind of Apple copied from. Oh, Lisa. Uh, the Lisa was also from Apple. So they copied their own thing. They, they simplified the, the Lisa. The Alto and the Star. Ah, the Alto and the Star. There you go. You found it. So a uh, great example for like deep memory access here. Um, <laughs> So the Alto, set 1972, uh, the Xerox Alto was released. Um, so these are now computers that are 10 years older even, right? So even less computing power. And you'll be surprised of like the ridiculously low amounts of, of, of computing power and RAM these guys had to work with. Um, and still, it had a graphical user interface. So at this point, you had to come up with something incredibly effective. So you couldn't do this on top of a Unix machine. This was not on top of a Unix machine. This was actually a computer that was sitting on somebody's desktop, not a big uh, Unix box. Um, 
And because of that, it used a model that is sort of the simplest way to do a graphical user interface, to do a Windows system. Single process, single address space. Meaning there's only one program really running, and that program is you know, going through all the various things, activities that are supposed to happen in a round-robin fashion. And of course, if one fails of those actions, then everything goes in and dies. And this is Smalltalk. Smalltalk was in development since the, the late 60s, um, about 69, and it was the language in which um, the Alto user interface and the whole Windows system, the whole system actually was uh, programmed, including all the apps. Smalltalk, in a way, therefore, uh, became the common ancestor of, of all Windows systems. Um, the Alto, as you know, introduced the desktop metaphor, it introduced overlapping windows on a screen, it over introduced pop-up menus, um, it introduced um, basically most of the things that you know today from your desktop. Some things came later with the star, like icons on the desktop, right? but, but pretty much everything else was there. Smalltalk people, when you ask people what's Smalltalk, they often say it's a programming language. And that's not wrong. Program Smalltalk is a programming language. It's also uh, pretty much the first successful operating, uh, object-oriented uh, programming language, sorry. But it was more than that. It <laughs> was a programming language, um, but also the operating system running on that machine. So everything was written in Smalltalk from the lowest, you know, device driver up to the, the highest level application. And that included the Windows system, of course. Smalltalk was the language that was, was developed um, that basically introduced the term object orientation. Um, and nowadays, this is not surprising, right? So, you know, object orientation means we've got objects. Objects communicate with messages that they send to each other. Um, everything is an object, in Smalltalk at least. Even a primitive data type, like a number, was implemented as an object. They really went all the ways. Um, on the other hand, um, the Alto had 64 kilobytes of RAM. Kilobytes, not megabytes, not gigabytes. Right? This is kilobytes. So that's not a lot. And still, this kind of system was running on top of it. So it was pretty slow, uh, we have to say. You remember maybe even the Lisa that already tried to get more sort of, you know, more nimble was uh, considered a very slow system. And only with the Mac that did away all the fancy object-oriented approaches with Smalltalk and replaced it with, at the time, Pascal, a plain procedural language that was much more effective to compile and run on a, a small computer, uh, it became really usable. But Smalltalk worked. You just had to wait for things to happen. And Smalltalk also was where the MVC pattern got introduced, Model View Controller, which is probably one of the uh, most successful design patterns um, that have ever made it into, into software engineering. Uh, with some adaptations, that's still uh, used today to, to build a graphic user interfaces. So here we see, a, you know, I don't know, maybe a typical uh, desktop of the system uh, and it's not just showing a, a drawing app down here, right, with a paint canvas and some, some tools around it uh, that are just, you know, sticking out here to the side curiously. No, it doesn't seem like there is a, um, a, a regular frame around the window. But we can also actually see here a class browser. Um, and I'll, I'll zoom in on that um, a little later. Um, so this part down here to maybe start with, it's a drawing program. Um, you got icons to allow you to select drawing mode, line style, brush, what you would be, uh, what you would expect. But what's surprising, because everything is implemented in Smalltalk, means that these things are also just written in Smalltalk. So you could actually go in and uh, move around these buttons here on the side uh, and change them while the system is running. So you can actually mess with the user interface itself. And we'll see some examples of, later, of that later, uh, how that works. In the right, upper right-hand side, uh, we see sorry, uh, we see a um, um, a file viewer that's up here. It's, it's looking at a um, some kind of text file that's being displayed. It's in the background. Um, upper left has a window 
uh, for entering and executing Smalltalk statements. And then the, uh, the class browser in the middle um, is a tool to actually inspect and modify the system's code while it's running. Um, we'll later see a modern version of Smalltalk called Squeak, uh, and there it's called the, uh, the system browser. So let's zoom on this, in on this, on this class browser here. As you can see here, uh, what you can browse here is you know, kernel classes, numbers, basic data structures, um, all kinds of stuff, down to user interface objects and files. Right? And um, so here, for example, we are, <clears throat> we are looking at the, uh, at the uh, float data type, or class, we should say. And the float class has math functions attached to it, apart from other things, like how to print it, initialize it, and so on. And in those math functions, there is the square root function. And we can click right through to that and see the square root function, how it's implemented in the data type of float. Uh, and here's the code. Now, this might look a little weird to you, uh, but the syntax is actually pretty easy to read. This is Smalltalk 74, um, where you would use curly brackets in, in C. We're using square brackets, basically. Um, and the, uh, this weird right arrow there means um, implements. Um, oh, or sorry, the, the, the right arrow means, um, means if, and it's now, uh, it's been changed to a keyword later, so you didn't have to use weird characters anymore. Uh, this assignment thing is basically today's um, uh, colon equals that you see oftentimes as um, assigning a value to a variable. And um, this uh, upper um, arrow that we see somewhere down there is actually what you today use as the, the caray. Uh, to return a value. So we could go in here um, and actually change the implementation of the square root throughout the whole system for every application that was using it. Um, this screenshot is actually from a version of Smalltalk that, that used the decompiler to save even more space because, hey, 64 kilobytes of RAM. Um, and you can see that the instance variables, therefore, are not very self-speaking, right? T1, T2, uh, they're very short. Um, because if you give them longer names, that takes up memory space. But what I want to convey here is that um, we have a system that is a single universe, right? Everything is running in one process, one address space, meaning everybody can talk to everybody else, see, call, uh, um, send messages to objects. I shouldn't say call procedures because we're now in object-oriented worlds. Um, so it's a very... Um, a very effective way to implement, right? You're saving a lot of resources doing it that way. Smalltalk was written in a, uh, as a virtual machine. So it was running as a machine-dependent virtual machine uh, that was a bytecode interpreter. So it was an interpreted language, which of course makes it, makes it even slower, but otherwise you couldn't go in and change the code of the OS live, right? Um, and Anything running on top of that machine, so your Smalltalk um, workspace, if you like, was running as a virtual image. So it's basically a bunch of Smalltalk classes with instantiated objects um, that you can capture as a snapshot, essentially, and store and send to somebody else. Initially, uh, the operating system and the whole Windows system that you just saw were merged into one thing. Later on, as computers got a little more powerful, um, Smalltalk could afford to put the uh, Windows system on top of the operating system and at least split those two uh, a little bit. Okay, so one thing to take away from the, from the Smalltalk model uh, is the model view controller paradigm. And that's really an important one um, if you're building any kind of um, you know, application code that, that includes a GUI. Let's say you're writing an application to simulate um, a race car, OK? So here's the user who's maybe uh, clicking buttons, moving sliders, or maybe even turning a steering wheel in a, in a gaming application. So he's creating events. Those events need to be processed by something in your application. Right? This is what's typically called the controller. So the controller is basically, in the MVC paradigm, representing what the user can do to change the state of the application. Your race car, how do you model a race car? Well, simplest possible way, it probably has a current speed. Right? Um, 
So part of the model of your race car is going to be a variable that contains the current speed. And then, of course, lots of other things, which gear you're in and which we, where you're headed, where you, how your wheel is turned and so on. How do you change the current speed of the car? Well, for example, by the user you know, clicking a button to say go faster or pressing a button on a game uh, controller. Um, so the controller picks up that user input and then passes that onto the model and says, hey, increase the speed a bit, the user wants you to go faster. So the model thereby changes its value. And the model you can think of in the simplest way as sort of a data structure. The model then says, okay, um, speed has increased. Now, you probably in your car simulator have a, a speed gauge, like a, a speedometer, like Tacho. You have some display of the current speed. How does that view, because it's, it's a view of, of data down here, how does that know that the speed has changed? How does it know that it needs to update? Somebody needs to tell it. In the original plain MVC paradigm, the model is not just a database. It actually is an active storage, if you like. So it says, anybody who wants to view, render, show my data needs to register with me, kind of like a callback. And if anything changes, I will tell these people who register with me. Yeah. So the view, the, the speedometer, when it was created, was registered with the model to say, I need your current speed. Whenever that changes, please let me know. So when the model changes its speed and its simulation in, in response to the user pressing the you know, go faster button, uh, the, the gas pedal, if you like, um, when the value changes, it actually tells the view hey, we got a new value to display. It's you know, 0.1 more than before, so please update yourself. And then the view can render you know, its needle showing the current speed or the number showing the current speed um, in the user interface. And that's what the user sees. So what's important to understand here is that we have two separate classes. One class is only there for displaying information, and the other one is only there for receiving input. The stuff that receives input could also be, for example, a push button. But a push button also has an output. Right? It's, the push button needs to be rendered somehow. And when it gets pressed and released, it needs to change its state. So it ha also has a visual component. Because controllers and views are often fairly closely linked to each other, you often have in a GUI app a controller and a way for the user to create input that is accompanied with the corresponding view. For example, a scroll bar creates data as a controller, but it also has a view that shows the current setting. Because there's this close relationship often between controllers and views, many later models that adopted the model view controller paradigm actually kind of bundle these things up. But they don't have to be, right? So the controller could literally be the button on your game controller um, that is represented as some class in your code that doesn't have any user interface, uh, at least nothing showing on the screen, and your view uh, could even just be, you know, how fast the track is speeding by your virtual 3D car simulation. So controllers and views are two separate things. Now, with an active model, um, we have a very clean model, right? We, we can basically uh, clearly see that um, if you take another example, like a, a text editor, that we can split up these things into all these different parts. Let's go through this. Uh, let's say I have a text editor the very sim simplest possible text editor. What would be my model in a text editor? Yeah? Well, the, the accumulation of characters and letters. Right. So, 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 yeah, exactly. So the, the string that sort of holds the, 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 the characters that have been, have been typed so far, exactly. Uh, what's a controller? What would be a controller class in a, in, in a very simple text editor? What, would, what kind of events would it, would it be listening for? Yeah? Keyboard. Keyboard, yeah, right. Mostly if, if we're talking about uh, maybe we don't even do uh, mouse in input. Maybe it's just a, you know, a, a textual editor. Because MVC doesn't just work for, for GUIs, right? It also works for textual interfaces. So if you write a simple text editor, um, you would listen for keyboard events and create new characters and tell the model, hey, add the following character because the key A just got pressed. So please add the character A. Uh, in uppercase and lowercase based on whether the shift key was held down, held down to your model. 
what's the view? Yeah, the text area. The text area where you display yeah. what's currently being contained in the model, right? So you type the A key, it gets appended to the model, the model updates the view and says, hey, please render that letter A uh, in addition to all the other letters that you're already showing in the text field. Um, yeah. So the controller knows the model by heart. So when uh, um, the letter H is pressed, it knows the context, was what it actually does to the model or just uh, pipes it through? No, it just, it just pipes it through. The model needs to decide what that means, right? The controller can just say, uh, hey, dear model, uh, the user just pressed the letter A while um, you know this window was in the foreground and so on, so it's clearly meant for, for this part of the model. Oh. And so the model then decides what to do with it. Right? It could also be that the controller says, hey, um, we got a um, I don't know, control A key press, and then the model will have to decide, okay, does something else to me. So then we have, we have a, an active model that basically does all the updating. But you can also, so you can also do that with a, with a passive model. Passive models mean that the model part of your code really only sits there and waits for changes. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't send anything to anybody. It doesn't care who, who is um, listening to, to it either. Right? It has no uh, notion of, of telling anybody else anything. So in this case, the controller needs to tell the view um, that something happened. So it needs to tell the view hey, I just changed the model, I just, you know, the letter A just got pressed, I sent that to the model, but that changes the model, and so you probably want to update your view. And then the view would have to uh, talk to the model and say, hey, um, something happened. But the problem, of course, is with this, that in this case, the view needs to explicitly pull information from the model. So if the model, for example, had an issue, let's say, I don't know, runs out of memory for, for holding the string, it would have no way to tell the view because it is passive. So because of that, um, you would typically um, expect the, uh, the controller to take care of both informing the view to up update the model, but you would also, sorry, uh, you would also expect the model to be able to raise flags, for example, to, to tell this to anybody who's, who's concerned with the model. <coughs> So this is sort of the, uh, the way that you can um, think of the model view controller paradigm as a fundamental structure that you can use if you want to cleanly separate the part of your code that really is about you know, the business logic that you're doing, or whatever that might be, uh, like simulating that race car, and how that gets visualized and how that gets controlled or interacted with. As I was saying, initially um, everything was in one space in Smalltalk, but later on the window system got uh, sort of separated out, and we ended up with uh, a separate UI construction environment uh, called Morphic that was uh, developed for Smalltalk. It represents two key concepts, and you'll have a bit of a, um, um, a short uh, paper on that, uh, called directness and liveness. Morphic tried to continue with this idea that everything is an object and is alive and can sort of have its own behavior, even in the UI um, world. So widgets in, in Morphic are called morphs, and every morph uh, can also be a container. So you can, actually any widget can contain in Morphic can other widgets, which is terrible for UI consistency, because I could actually create a button and put inside the button, I could put you know, a scroll bar, for example. With nothing keeping you from that. Yeah, it's weird, but you can do that. Um, the, um, the morphs are used to, to create the, uh, or for the reification of the structure of the window, uh, the widgets and their layout. And they, have an auto they can have autonomous behavior. Um, for example, animation. Right? So if you had um, a, uh, an alert, uh, lamp blinking, that could actually blink by itself, that could be live behavior that's attached to it. Directness, in short, uh, and we'll see this in a, in a short demo that Sebastian will run in a minute, um, means that in Morphic you actually don't need a separate interface builder or, or editor to build your GUI. Why? 
because you can just create GUI elements on the fly. It's an interpreted language. You've got a terminal. And you can actually manipulate them while the application is running. So there's no separate um, GUI editor for that. You just change the look and feel of widgets by pointing at them, pressing a particular keyboard combination, and then you're in the sort of um, yeah, options dialog for that, for that widget. If you want to actually get to a particular part of a, a widget tree, you often have many things overlapping each other. To give you an example, um, you got a window with a, with a, um, that's a drawing application, and the drawing application has a canvas. So you might want to interact with that canvas, or you might want to interact with the root window that contains the canvas, because the canvas itself can't sit directly on, on the desktop. It needs some kind of root window container, top level container that talks to the window manager. So you get two win uh, windows already or two widgets to talk to. Now maybe in front of that is a dialog box that just popped up. So you might want to interact with that. But that also has a top level container. It has um, maybe a text field and come some buttons in it. And the button itself then you might want to interact with. So do you want to interact with the button or with the container of the dialog or with the canvas behind that of the root window or with the root window container? So it's all kinds of things are stacked on top of each other in, in the Z direction. Right? So if you want to interact with a particular widget, you often have to sort of click through a layering of, of Z, a Z level layering of many widgets that are under your mouse pointer. For that, there's a particular um, sort of a control uh, keyboard combination with clicking uh, so that you can click through that layer. And, and Sebastian will show you this. The other thing is that, that uh, morphic interplanet was the so-called liveness. Liveness means that <coughs> Um, when you go in and have an application running, it's always uh, editable. So you don't have a separate edit the GUI and then run the application. If you've ever written any application with a graphical user interface, you probably know the, I'm going to tweak the graphical user interface in a graphical editor or in code, whatever, and I'm going to run my application to see whether it works. Right? This separation does not exist in Morphic. Um, because you can just go in while the application is running, change things on the fly. The, uh, when I was talking about reification, um, this is the way that Morphic does layout, right? So one morph containing other submorphs, it can also implement a layout policy on them, just like we saw with the row column widgets and those kinds of things in, in X, for example. And the animation, um, of um, of uh, morphs or widgets in, in, in Morphic is done through a, um, a step method. So every morph can have a so-called step method, and that method gets called every time um, a new frame is drawn, so about 60 times a second. Remember, we're still in small talk. We're still in the sort of happy, cooperative, multitasking, collaborative multitasking world. So we need to rely on the system uh, to make all these calls, we need to rely on everybody who is in that step method not to take two minutes for the animation because otherwise everything would break, right? So um, it's, a, it's a fragile environment, but extremely versatile. I've never seen any graphical user interface toolkit that you could mess with so badly as you can with, with Morphic and Squeak. And to show you that, uh, Sebastian will, will give you a, a quick demo. Squeak, I should say, while Sebastian is getting set up, is an uh, open source implementation of a modern Smalltalk environment. Smalltalk by itself, by the way, uh, was introduced and developed by Alan Kay, uh, one of the incredibly smart and influential people from, uh, for the modern history of computing. Um, he basically uh, came up with the idea of what you would today probably call an iPad. If you look for his, his early ideas, like the, um, uh, I think called a Dynapad or something, he drew a picture in, in somewhere in the 70s or so of a guy sitting under a tree and drawing on what, you know, a kid actually drawing on what looks like a tablet clearly to us. Um, and he imagined that that kind of use of computers in a very personal and intimate way um, when other people were still excited about the possibilities of a PC on your desktop. 
And he created Smalltalk as a language um, in part to, to make that stuff happen. And then uh, Squeak is a much, much more recent re-implementation of, of Smalltalk that you can actually download on, on any computer. It's kind of as ubiquitous probably as, as the X-Window system. So here we go. Um, I'm going to maybe turn off the lights to get a little bit more contrast. There we go. OK. So here we are in Squeak. Maybe I turn off the dock to get even more space. Um, yeah, everything what you see here is the world. It sort of has a menu that very much looks like this Mac menu here on top. And um, yeah, basically. Yeah, so we should say we are running Squeak as an application in you know sort of yeah. user level space here on a Mac uh, operating system. So originally, Smalltalk would be running on the hardware, right? So it yeah. would be the operating system, and you wouldn't see any other host operating system around it. But nowadays, since you can't really buy machines that run Smalltalk natively, um, you buy you know some PC or, or Mac or any kind of Linux box, and you run Squeak on top of that. So let's first have a look at sort of this menu here on top. There's sort of projects. Basically, um, you can save and load projects. What is a project? It's basically sort of a state of this whole environment of this universe containing the windows that you have there and all other morphs or widgets that are sort of positioned there. Um, um, of course, the power of Smalltalk is sort of to edit stuff that is typically provided by the OS. So we sort of have these menu controls here. And let's sort of have the first example for sort of our directness approach, because this is nothing to minimize. It's sort of a window menu. And I can directly sort of change the title of this window. So um, I'm going to greet you all here, um, just so that it is a little uh, more personal. I should probably say press OK instead of cancel. Um, so there's even more in this window menu. This is probably the nicest feature ever. I can sort of select a window color. And yeah, this is the i10. So probably we have a nice orange. Yeah, that's it. Um, so far, this window here, very nice. There's even this small talk balloon. It's sitting sort of on the window, out of the bounds. Very interesting. Let's have a look at the tools. There's this browser and there's a workspace. Basically, all these things that you've already seen in the screenshot from Smalltalk 74. Let's open a workspace and sort of try to fill our world with some content. So maybe at first we try to create a simple morph, something like a container that is probably a bordered morph. Yeah. Um, basically, this would work like that. So we sort of have to reassign this variable container to a new bordered morph. Um, and Smalltalk has this nice syntax that it sort of tries to look natural, so I can probably add some new parameter to just like color colon and then color green. Make it very pretty. Of course, as you know, if you don't put widgets or morphs onto some surface, they won't be visible. So let's use the second line of code here that says open in world, so that this thing is actually will be there. So how do I execute stuff in Smalltalk? Oh, by the way, I guess this is quite small, right? Maybe we yeah, just... Yeah, Smalltalk. Ha -ha. <laughs> Smalltalk. So we could just set the font and maybe make it larger or even larger. I don't know. Um, make it even larger. Probably easier for you to see. Okay. So there we are. Um, is that fine for you guys back there? Yep. Better. Okay. So how do I execute it? Basically, I can right click and then press the do it. Do it. Sounds very nice, right? Do it. So let's do it. And there it is. This is our morph here. It's green. Well, it's quite small so far. Currently, let's make it bigger. Um, so I again grab this container and sort of define the extent to be something like I don't know, 200 times 200 pixels. This will look great, right? So let's do it. There it is. Oh, it's larger. Make it even larger. We, we need more space. I guess we definitely need more space. So I can re-execute this line again. Basically, everything is always executed what I highlighted. So You can simple. also see the Smalltalk syntax basically is always object message, right? Mm -hmm. So you tell what object you're trying to send a message to. 
and then you just mention the message. There's no uh, parentheses or stuff like this. Yes, please. You always create a new object, right? No. This is still the same one. I never, um, if I would re-execute this line of code, it would create a new one yeah. because I would reassign the uh, variable. But as I'm only executing the stuff that is highlighted. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah can this you is only see executing the last line. Light, slightly bluish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, it just makes sense because I wondered why you remembered the. Why it rem Yeah. Yeah. Let's have some uh, fun again. Uh, Add something like this a star again. Um, do the same stuff all over again. Uh, define some extent to it, maybe 200 times 200, and then we will add it to the container because, yeah, this is probably more interesting than having it again in the world. So now I sort of define the star, add it, and do the say Do so you execute in the last three lines now, right? Yeah, exactly yeah. the last mm -hmm. three lines here. Oh yeah, there it is. See, it's already connected to this thing. Yeah, nice. Probably, I want to have some layout policy here. It's sort of stupid that this thing is, well, a child of the um, my nice bordered morph. I would rather have it sort of stick inside there. So, as uh, Smalltalk makes the layout policies tangible, I can sort of say, container, dear container, please have this layout policy here. And it should be a table layout. Very great. Um, what happens once? So again, we should say you're creating actually a new object a that new is object. of the class table layout, and exactly. then we have an object that is the table layout policy, and that gets assigned to the the variable or the instance variable of the container. And what so what you see happens is that the star immediately jumps into this container because it is now laid out as a table. Um, we can still sort of uh, refine uh, the list direction of this thing. I'd rather have the star on the um, right side, so something like right to left. Okay, now we execute the um, last line of code, see what happens there. Do it. What did I do? Maybe the, um, the hash right, right to left confused it. No, it's actually okay, like that, I think. Do it, do it, do it, do it. There. Ah. So, there's some constant value, so it has the hash. So, very nice. We now have this thing, you see it's connected. Um, what can we do more? Well, there's this halo menu. Um, if I alt click and so on something, a lot of buttons pop up. I will scroll to that so it's a little easier to see. Um, and maybe I can use some options to my flag here. So probably it would be nice if it, yeah, probably if it had round corners or maybe if it had a drop shadow. Let's use a drop shadow. So, oh, nice drop shadow. See how it elevates from the screen, very nice. Um, also, we mentioned the spatial demultiplexing. So um, if I out click one time, I'm in this green canvas. If I click again, I'm in the star. So I can do the same thing here, sort of uh, give it a new color. Yeah, just pick the color that I've already had in the window here. Um, this concept also works with labels. So again, we can manipulate stuff of the OS. I can click here, click again, I'm now sort of in this label of the window controls and I'm just going to flip it because if it's upside down, it's always better. Um, um, so this is a good illustration that there is really no, uh, no difference between objects that you are creating in your terminal window there on the fly and objects that already exist because they're part of the, what you would call the, the operating system, right? Or the GUI toolkit. Yeah, complex. But there's also this nice search bar. So let's inspect some uh, code that we have here. Let's have a look at the uh, scroll bar, for instance. So as you can see, the system browser pops up and it shows us the scroll bar. The scroll bar has a lot of met methods. Oh, I guess I love the adopt paint color. It sounds useful. So how is adopt paint color in, uh, implemented? Usually there it's called by somebody, then this guy passes a parameter, a color, and then this is sort of set if it's not nil. But 
I like blue. So it doesn't matter whatever a person says, I want the scroll bars to be blue. Let's save these changes here by pressing the accept button. It asks me to insert my initials so that there's this, uh, there's this change log. I will do this. Press accept. So what happens? Oh, nice. Every window now has a blue scroll bar. Um, this looks quite cool, obviously. I mean, why wouldn't I want to do this? Um, so maybe as a last step, you, this window, I mean, we've already did so much with it, but maybe let's do a little more with it. Um, the balloon is currently attached to the window. I want to have this balloon. So I'm going to click through the list of it and then sort of remove it here while using this home icon and now it's no longer connected. Very nice. So now I'm just taking my flag. It always wanted to have a balloon. I'm putting it somewhere here and I can right click it then embed it into my bordered morph. You know everything can be a container so why shouldn't my bordered morph be a container? The layout policy again takes place and uh, it's now layered out as a table. And sort of to make my system browser even more interesting I will now sort of attach this thing to the system browser. I mean why not? It's uh, probably nicer so yeah. And Okay, this overlaps the workspace now, so probably we had to um, provide clipping for this. So, let's see, we fixed it again. And now to completely go nuts, I mean, why not? Why don't we just uh, rearrange the little windows a little better? And uh, yeah, we can just basically flip everything however we like or reposition it and yeah, this scroll, uh, probably I've broken the system now. <laughs> so this is how it, uh, what it is like to work with Smalltalk. I think uh, I've so, created a masterpiece. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's it's a wonderful example of a system that is, in its root, had to be super efficient. So there was no room for like uh, um, preemptive yes. multitasking and and whatnot. Um, Scrolling is a little weird when it's shifted. <laughs> it it is, isn't it? And and the the effectiveness or the efficiency of it means that it's very open, right? It it lets you do a lot of things. It puts a lot of responsibility on the developer to actually write good code that doesn't mess up the system or that breaks, you know, the collaborative uh, multitasking that's going on, or you know, to just go in and change something in the in the root class. Again, this would not fly well in a you know modern. Uh, internet world where everything has to be super protected and and kept away from uh, people who are going to mess with your data or exploit it or or um, put viruses into your into your systems. So from a maybe um, originally less uh, from from happier times, I should maybe say, uh, where it was okay to have a system as open as this. And again, what does that give you? Um, I think it gives you a, a hint of a system that is super transparent that where you can see exactly how the interface is built. This is the closest I have ever seen to a system where I could feel actually as if I could do what I showed in the very first slide of this, this class, peel back the, you know, the layer, peel back the UI and look at the code behind it because literally Smalltalk lets, and Squeak lets you do that. Right? You can see you can just click through to write to the code that is processing that event on that scroll bar, figure out how it works. If you don't like how far the scroll bar jumps each time in a window, you go in, change the code, it does it the way that you do, that you want to. So I think it's a very interesting system as a, um, again, as a study object and as something that um, lets you really look at the the insides of a system yeah yeah is uh, there anything like a lifeline if you fuck up really badly while um customizing this mm -hmm. so you can't actually access the menus like you usually would or you can't access the coding menu mm -hmm. because you just change everything around like so it's, it's it's a little tricky i mean uh you can pass on changes in two ways the default way that you pass on a change is that you you pass on a whole universe, sort of, you know, that you launch Morphic, uh, you launch Squeak, um, and by default, when you pass on 
a change that you pass on the entire virtual machine or virtual image, I should say. The machine always stays the same. Um, because the virtual machine is not written in Smalltalk, of course. Right? That's written in like a, uh, in these cases in, in a language that sort of works on the on the host system. Maybe one addition. Um, of course, we are only manipulating the, this virtual image. So if you go into the system browser and re-implement something, and then add a syntax error in it, especially for something that is really often used, like the scroll bar, your system will become unusable ever again because, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, it cannot execute it. It will crash when trying to create the, or call this method, and yeah. I mean, what you've seen is there was like a log system that you could log what kind of changes you had made at what time, and of course you can go back to earlier versions of your snapshot basically, but um, it's not so much a, a system which you would write one app and that app then gets transported somewhere else. You would typically really create a whole small talk image that, that runs a particular scenario. Right? So that's more of the model there. Um, just to think a little bit in that um, in that space. And I think Morphic is a good example um, because we can, sh we can see how it actually works and it's documented how it works. Let's put yourself, ourselves into the shoes of um, somebody who needs to write the algorithm that actually determines the layout of a morph that includes a tree of submorphs. Okay, so you're now tasked with writing the code um, to do the layout of a morph, so of a widget, that has a bunch of children. How would you go about this? What would be your, um, you know, for example, you know, if, if, if one morph is a dialog, is supposed to be a dialog box, it has a text field and, and two or three buttons at the bottom um, laid out next to each other. Um, we're not concerned about uh, the initial layout of these things. We're concerned about I'm now resizing um, that dialog. Okay, so the dialog has a text field and three buttons. Now I make the dialog wider. What should happen? Maybe the text field wants to grow, use all the available space, but maybe the buttons are not supposed to get wider. Maybe they're supposed to just stay at a particular size because it doesn't make sense to have a button that's this wide. So, so there are there are policies that that the layout morph needs to needs to know. You, you know. We can make up our own policies, decide what they're supposed to be for a particular kind of layout morph and for its children. But now how do you implement them? How do you go through and actually as, you res as the user resizes that dialog, what should happen in code to figure out where everything needs to go? Can we have some, have some ideas? How would, you, how would you do that? Yeah. Uh, well, you define rules, uh, like a uh, button um, should be maximum uh, 50 pixels wide. Okay, so we've got rules for um, the maximum size of a button, let's say. Um, would we also have rules for minimum sizes, maybe? Makes sense, right? So to also know, okay, buttons need to be minimum this size. Now, a button will probably want to have a word in that, right? It might say, I need to display the word OK. So I need to be minimum wide enough to show the word OK or to look like a reasonable button, probably a little wider. Um, and maximum, I don't want to be wider than this. Or maybe, you know, the button says I want to be wider. Uh, it depends on what, what, the, what, the, what you decide the button layout policy should be. Um, now, what else do we need? What would be, for example, the um, minimum and maximum sizes of that um, container that contains the, the buttons in the text field? Uh, well, they use uh, the uh, window size. Um, so okay. the label expands with the window. Okay, but let's say I'm now taking that dialog, and you've probably seen this, actually, when you've used the UI at some point, if, especially if it's done badly. Uh, you take a window, and you keep making it smaller and smaller. Can you, for example, a dialog box, can you, if it's resizable, can you make it super small? Uh, uh, only until the point. Uh -huh. what, what's that point? And the point where all texts can be displayed. Exactly. So where is that minimum size coming from? 
on the label. Yeah, so the minimum size of a container, a container by itself usually doesn't have a requirement of a particular size, but it gets that requirement from its children, right? It contains some stuff, and that stuff may have minimum size requirements, so that determines how big the container needs to be at least. It needs to at least be big enough to show all the minimum sizes of all its, all, all its children. Now, if you think algorithmically, we, we said that we have a tree, right? There's, there's the parent, the container, and let's say there's the three buttons and maybe the text field in there, as it's four children. How do you uh, go about finding out that, uh, that size that you can go to? Yeah? No, we have like the utmost, up, the utmost children shouldn't be just defined like the minimum size because this specifies how much, yeah, space it needs at least. Mm -hmm. Aha, so we've got one press where we're probably actually going to be going from the bottom because the leaves in our widget tree are usually the things that actually contain stuff, right? Everything else is just containers. The leaves are usually buttons, scroll bars, text fields, things that are actually visible. Like the inner nodes in a widget tree are usually mostly things that actually don't contain things. Um, so you have to start at the leaves and kind of go up and fi first figure out um, what's the minimum size. Right? Because every leaf in your tree is an actual user interface component that has at least needs at least this much space. So we can gather that, as you said, in, you know, by going up in the tree. So now we know the minimum sizes. What, what's next? Maybe we've got more space. Maybe the user actually resized the window to be really big. What, what do you do next? Yeah? And we have to divide the, the space we have available, like the resize, when well, we resize it to a full screen. Mm -hmm. We use, you see like we have 500 pixels on the left, and mm -hmm. yeah, then we have to divide this according to the minimum max size icons. Exactly. So once we've arrived at the minimum d requirements for everybody, then we can figure out what space we have left as a container and then we can distribute that again. And that happens in the other direction, right? That goes top down. Because I can now say, oh, okay, I know that you guys need this space. I have this much available. So I'm giving each of you one third of that space. And then these guys, if they are in themselves submorphs again, can say, okay, I've, I'm going to split that up among my children like this. So there's, a, there's a, a, a process going on in which you basically go in a first pass uh, computing the minimum size of all the submorphs, bottom up, right? The buttons, each button says I need that much space. The text field says I need that much space. Then in a second pass, you figure out, okay, how much space have I used up? How much space do I have available still? And you take the, the rest that's available and distribute it down the tree again in a, in a uh, top-down fashion. So that's a, that's a good approach to actually figure out a layout, so up and down the tree. Now, you guys are computer scientists, so um, what I just described, if you do that for a big tree, let's say you've got, you know, um, a application running with lots of document windows open, partly overlapping, um, hiding behind other windows, um, what kind of improvements could I do to this kind of algorithm to make it faster? Yeah. Uh, to add uh, sizes, um, co concrete sizes to the uh, widget. So if the widget says, well, that's my minimum and my maximum is the same. So mm -hmm. if I tell you my minimum and, well, I'm the topmost child, I don't need more space. So mm -hmm. this tree branch can just cut off in the second pass. Uh -huh. Right. So you could prune the tree if you have areas that say, I need exactly this space, not more, not less. Uh, so you could cut things off. Yes. Um, are there other things you could do? Remember the difference in the in the widgets uh, life cycle that we talked about um, last time with with X, but of course here it's the same thing. Or other ideas? Yeah. yeah. Another idea was prioritize branches. So if uh -huh. I have a branch that is in the front or is prioritized. It gets mm -hmm. more space, and when then it's nothing left, then the branches are pruned too. Okay, you could do that. Um, 
I'm not sure whether it would save you computation because it's still, I mean, prioritization typically just means you do things in a different order. In, right? in worst case, no, but mm. in best case, it saves you a lot of time because the first branch just takes everything. Okay, yeah, yeah. If you, if you have that kind of prioritization and it works in your interface, sure. Um, remember the different states, um, you know, managed, realized, mapped, and so on, yeah. Just cut off every branch that's not mapped? Yeah. So anything that's not visible in the UI currently, if you, let's say, if the user creates a, or, or the user, if an application creates a dialog box and, and puts stuff in it, and you're not currently showing it, then you don't actually need to go through the computation, right? That's especially important if, in code, I'm creating a, a box piece by piece. I'm adding a button. I'm adding a second button. I'm adding a third button, one by one. I don't need to recompute the layout of this thing every time. I just need to recompute it once, everything's in there. Yeah? Um, you said that in the first step we compute the minimum size of our sub mask. Can yeah. we do this in advance and start somewhere and then access it? Because we now have to check the whole tree for stuff. But mm -hmm. if, we, if we had this in advance, we wouldn't need to compute yeah. it on, on demand. So you can do it on it in advance, but remember things could change at any time. So a button might say, um, my minimum size is 30 pixels, I'm just an OK button, but maybe the user changes the interface language to French and now it says something much longer, so now the minimum size has changed. So you'd have to have a way to sort of um, mark these things as now I need to update them. Could, could we do this, yeah, so like callback key because how often do we actually change the minimum size of the button? That's right, yeah. So you could do that in, in a callback fashion, or you could just generally say, I'm going to introduce a caching principle that says, I'm just going to remember uh, in a top-down fashion, did anything change in this subtree? Right? Did I have any changes in here? If I didn't have any changes, then I can consider this thing as a rigid that just needs and is going to get exactly this space. Yeah? I would go as far and say everything with, with, uh, which is not managed will just get um, not um, in the, um, I will. Uh, if it's not managed, then there is no computation going on, right? But, but that's that's almost by definition because as long as it's not managed, it means I'm not doing any uh, layout with it. But we've covered pretty much the, the the best options here anyway. The deferred layout basically says don't lay out until it's visible. Um, you can prune things, for example, maintain a, a, what you just mentioned. Uh, the sort of the layout for a subtree is okay. I, I've computed it and don't touch it uh, again as long as the space that it needs is available. Of course, if things get tight, you may have to recompute it because it may have used up more space than it technically has to have. Uh, and then finally, you can uh, go in and say, uh, I'm actually going to just limit my recomputation up to the next stable submorph. If, for example, there is a, a canvas on the screen that is 100 by 100 pixels wide and it has a fixed size like that, then I just need to rearrange my layout inside that, but itself is already 100 by 100, so above that nothing's going to change because it will never change its own size. It will cut off things if it needs to. So there's lots of ways that you can improve this. Um, another example of um, um, morphic uh, is, and how you can understand how these GUI toolkits work, is how it manages redraws. So, uh, Morphic manages a damage list, which basically means um, whenever a morph changes, for example, a checkbox gets checked, it will get, it's the bounding box of that object will get added to the list of damaged areas. Right? And then each frame, so 30 times a second, 60 times, depending on how fast it runs, all the morphs get redrawn that intersect any of the bounding boxes that are in the damage list. Makes sense, right? So if I had a morph that changed its, its contents, then I need to redraw it and everything else that might be intersecting with it. This looks ugly if you watch it in real time, but uh, Morphic, like many toolkits, uses double buffering. You probably know what double buffering is. You basically paint into an off-screen area, and when you're done painting, you swap it in in one go so that the user doesn't see the, the tear that you sometimes get when you have bad video synchronization. And <coughs> the, 
this double buffering prevents you seeing the construction of the, uh, of the animation. And of course, you do this um, off screen, back to front. Right? You first draw the things that are in the back, then you draw uh, the things that are in front of them, basic on, on your Z layering of, of, of widget, widgets that you have in front of each other. And once you're done, you copy everything over. So um, again, you're computer scientists. What are some improvements to this? Currently, I'm going in every widget that changes, every morph that changes, I take its bounding box, um, and I put it in a damage list, and then I go through all, the, all morphs, check whether they're intersecting with any of these on an x and y intersect uh, algorithm. And if they do, I redraw them. I do this in z order from the back to front. Any, yeah? Check whether they are even uh, whether they can, uh, whether they are visible. Visibility, of course. Right? So you could say if one morph is small and I'm drawing another one after that in front of it that's bigger, then the first one is occluded. It's completely invisible. Right? So I wouldn't have to draw that. Except transparency or even morphs that have holes in them, which is an extreme case of transparency, right? So the XIs are a good example that we saw in the X-Window system. If you have stuff like that, then you can't just say, oh, the XIs are a window that's this size at the bounding box, and there's something tiny behind it. I don't need to draw it, because it might actually peek through. What else could I do? Let's say I have um, a, um, a row column layout. Okay, a couple things in rows and columns laid out. And I want to, and, and I got a marker for uh, something in there changed, like one of the items in that row column layout changed. Normally I would mark the row column widget as dirty and basically as damaged and redraw it. What's more effective? especially with row column, which is kind of you know, very x, y axis aligned. How can I redraw less than the entire row column widget? Maybe only redraw one cell, or only one part? Yeah, yeah. So, with row columns, which are laid out in like a nice x, y fashion, it's pretty easy to say, I'm going to not use the bounding box of the entire thing, but just use the bounding box of the one thing that was changed. Right? So I don't need to um, uh, trigger these things all the way up. And then, of course, there's this minor things like, let's say I have um, a checkbox that yet got changed, and then that checkbox is inside a... Um, dialog window, and then that got, whole dialog window got changed in some way, maybe resized. I don't need to redraw that twice, right? So I can remove things from the redraw list that are already inside a larger bounding box that has to be checked anyway. But that just reduces the number of bounding boxes in the damage list that I need to check against. So that's a couple uh, examples of, of tweaks. We'll have a paper for you that is about Morphic uh, that talks about some of these algorithms, and I think it's a good example because there was a time when these systems were built where people were actually writing about them openly. Nowadays, you go to Apple and say, hey, how are you doing this thing with your you know, fancy animations? They're like, well, you know, we just do it. We're not telling you. So uh, this is good stuff to read because it will talk you through from a software engineering point of view on how you built this kind of stuff. As a wrap-up for... Um, what we have here, um, I wanted to show you this, this history overview. And um, this is kind of a teaser into uh, the newsbook chapter that uh, you guys have a, has a, as a reading assignment on Moodle, um, because this actually um, tells you about a lot of different systems. Now, today, we've talked about X from 1984 on, and about Smalltalk from the 1970s on. Um, but if you look through the, the news chapter book, you'll find actually there's a lot more stuff. Right? There is uh, systems that came out before X, like Tahoe, DLS Docs, and so on. And then, of course, the, uh, the star. Um, Tahoe was the, uh, the system um, 
uh, running, I think, on the, on the Alto, if I'm not mistaken. And then we've got uh, alternatives to X, like the Andro system, um, or, of course, the news window system, which is why the chapter is from the news book, and the commercially uh, more widely um, successful ones, Mac and, and Windows, along with, with X and its later descendants, of course. The news book chapter gives you a really nice overview of these systems, tells you what special characteristics of each are, uh, and what the effects are of picking an architecture with single or multiple address spaces, single or multiple process uh, structures, um, and it gives you a couple more ideas of uh, things that um, came out at cool ideas at the time, maybe didn't make it into today's systems, but some of them um, come back again later. We'll see some examples of that, like the um, when we saw the, uh, the, the Lisa uh, interface, the original Lisa interface didn't have an option to save documents, for example. It was always saved. You didn't have to explicitly save unless you wanted to keep a particular version as a sort of a marker to say, that's a version that I want to hold on to. But your changes were always tracked and saved automatically. And that kind of disappeared from the landscape for 20 years. And then uh, Mac OS X, a couple of years back, introduced this amazing new thing, which is that, hey, we're always saving your document. You don't need to explicitly hit save every time because, just because you're paranoid. It's the exact same method that just was reintroduced. So many of these ideas come back uh, around and are being reintroduced under other names. That's it for small talk and X for today and for this overview. Uh, take a look at the news book. Maybe also take a look at the um, paper on um, Morphic. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.